Welcome everyone. I am Chris Gore from Film Threads. I am obviously pre-coffee today. And <laughs> Alan is waiting in the wings. Alan is waiting in the wings to join us today on the show. We're going to be talking about M. Night Shyamalan's Knock at the Cabin. Also, the latest episodes of Velma. What does Alan think? I can't wait. Plus, uh, we'll be discussing The Last of Us Episode 3, along with 80 for Brady. Yes, Alan and I both saw 80 for Brady because you don't have to. Maybe. We'll see. Uh, I'm curious to hear what Alan's thoughts are. Plus, a very special guest today on the show. At the end of the show, we're talking to actor David Desmulchin. How do you know him? You probably first noticed him in The Dark Knight. He played one of the Joker's henchmen. He was also in Dune as Piter DeVries. He's also uh, played in the Ant-Man movies. And as Polka Dot Man in James Gunn's The Suicide Squad. Uh, David has some new projects he's here to talk to us about. He's been a guest on the show before. Not trying to brag or anything. But uh, he he is one of the good ones in Hollywood fighting the good fight and just doing incredibly good work. I hope you're having a good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. I um, I have not had a sip of coffee today, and it's it's a real problem. Let's get the show started. Let's get going. It's it's our Friday film threat live cast. Let's go. <laughs> Okay, this is normally the part where Alan would join me. Let me get up. I'm going to get Alan. Give me a second here. <laughs> here he is. Alan. That's how to make an entrance, folks. That's. <laughs> Alan, oh Alan made an entry, entrance right through Sharon Stone's legs. If you uh, are watching us on video, a lot of I didn't realize a lot of people listen to us on Spotify or listening platforms. Some people do the audio only version of listening to Film Threat, I guess. So, it, you know, if you're out on your walk, if you're out in the world, if you're just listening to this, you just you just uh, dodged a bullet. <laughs> because I think if you had seen the video, you, um, I, I, I don't know if you would not, I don't know if you would have loved it. I don't know if you would have loved it. We'll see. Alan, how's it going, man? Good. I'm exhausted. Uh, I should probably reveal, uh, my mom passed away last week. And, uh, so we're, I had a meeting with my brothers and my dad and, and my mom's sisters. And, uh, supposed to be a two hour meeting turned out to be a 10 hour meeting. And uh, I got zero done yesterday, so yeah, well, I should point out. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, these these are uh, Apple II disk drives, and uh, I stole that from my mom as a as a memory to her. So, uh, well, we're all sending um, you know positive thoughts your way, Alan, and I, oh, I know you. that everyone in the chat is you know. Uh, I, I I mean I knew about this. It's not mine to say, but um, I wondered if you were going to say anything, and so yeah. yeah. Yeah, I figure eventually I had to, you know, and uh, yeah, she actually passed away during our uh, our Oscar nomination live cast. So. so, well, look, I um, my father passed away in 2012. I was in the room when it happened. He was in hospice, um, losing a parent. There's no, there's, you know what 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 do you say so i know that you've yeah. been dealing with a lot and i'm i'm surprised I, when you told me i said well just take time off and um alan uh you know didn't just said i'm just gonna keep going and just doing what i'm doing and and uh you know you can still take time off alan i know i mean <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean clearly yeah. yesterday was You're a obligated. You don't have to be i mean that's so. a tough thing it's it's kind of like what am i gonna do sit around and mope or uh you know, it, obviously you kind of take breaks throughout the day to kind of deal with emotions and feelings, but right. you know, <laughs> like my mom, we just press on, you know, that's kind of been the motto of her life. Yeah. I, I was kind of the same way. I was kind of in a daze, like after my father mm -hmm. passed away, but then it's, uh, you know, um, 
you know, you kind of like getting back into routine does help. And then you do have those moments. There's not a day that goes by. I don't think about, think about my dad and um, just all the stuff that we did. Like yeah. we, we in, the, in the late nineties, we, we went to the Rose bowl in Pasadena to see Michigan play in the Rose bowl. One of the best memories he came out yeah. to the West coast. They used to play a lot in the Rose bowl, by the way. They used to, but not anymore. Yeah. Not they, anymore, they changed so. the whole structure of it. Well, um, you know, uh, we will persevere. We will persevere. Yeah. And we uh, we have a lot to review today, yeah. so let's get right to By it. By the way, she did she did watch the live cast. So, are you kidding me? No, I'm not. She she's like, oh yeah, I just saw you guys uh, the other day talking oh about my God, Alan. Yeah, so we have one less uh, subscriber now. Uh, oh man, um, and and perfect. Chris said, "Get back to work, damn it!" <laughs> <laughs> and you you highlighted that one. I didn't highlight it. For <laughs> Alan is the one that's highlighting the chat questions and comments here. So yeah. um, Solomon Thornton says, greetings, dudes and dudettes. Imperfect says, for the Alan Paint Fund, Film Threat Rocks. By the way, yes, Alan is going to paint. Yeah. And I'm very excited that he's painting. It's not going to happen soon, but it will happen probably in the next month. I'm going to say month. Yeah, definitely month. not until everything, the uh, funeral's next week. So definitely yeah. not doing it before then. I had a feeling Alan was hiding there, says Shuxy. Yeah. Grady Huckabee for five says, great hanging with you guys at the meetup last night. Hey, Grady. 80 for Grady. Grady is a new <laughs> member of our movie meetup group. Looking forward to seeing more movies with the crew. Well, I will say, and I believe it's Thursday. I want to say the 16th. Um, yeah. Thursday, February 16th. We are meeting at the AMC Burbank 16 to see the 6 p.m. IMAX screening of Ant-Man will be meeting at the Yard House about 4 p.m. Everyone is welcome to join. Everyone and anyone is welcome to join. Uh, you don't have to see the 6 p.m. show. You can see another screening of Ant-Man. But we usually you know, meet up early, see the movie, and then have a post-film conversation. So there you go. Um, James Ricciuti for $9.99 says, For Alan, my condolences. She raised a great son. Yeah, yeah. She had three, and she got one right. <laughs> your brothers? You have two brothers? Well, you're yeah. telling me. Yeah, like, all right. Um, yeah, well, I got tasked with the eulogy, so that's going to be the fun the fun one. Yeah, if only you were a writer. Yeah. That would be, um... Oh, man, yeah. <laughs> I got the first draft. They sent me the first draft of Mom's History, and I'm like, yeah, I got to rewrite this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's perfect. You have you've yeah. been building up because uh, you've got God. How many years of experience as an editor now? Six years. Yeah, six seven years maybe. No, yeah, so, uh, yeah somewhere around there. Yeah, approaching seven. Well, uh, I have faith in you. Solomon Thornton says the Last of Us episode three was okay. I just wish they replicated the introduction to Bill in the game. It was cool, and what happens afterward had me at the edge of my seat. Solomon, I have not. I'm sort of three hours into the game, so I haven't gotten to Bill yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I have thoughts on that that kind of connect to uh, Knock at the Cabin, and we'll get into that. Alan and I have uh, we got yeah. we got to get into it. We gotta, I mean, I have I have even more feelings about that third episode. I'm yeah, I, don't know. I saw it a second time, and so um, and then I saw Knock at the Cabin a second time. So we should talk about it. Okay, uh, we'll but let's. I, I feel like we we should get right into it. I think it's time that we pivot. Wait, how do I do this? <laughs> and here we go. We're gonna go. Uh, wait, this is the wrong. It's the wrong thing. All right, here we go. Uh, no, wait. Here's what we're gonna do. We're going to pivot again. Folks, I appreciate your patience today. Appreciate your patience. <laughs> All right. I, didn't I have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> I know what I'm doing here. Oh, Alan's there we go. Tell us all about the new episodes of Velma. Velma <laughs> episodes seven and eight. Why? Because, because we put out a bunch of our reviews and we do clips. And then the Velma 
like reviews will get 8,000. I'm not going to lie. 8,000 views. Then the other ones get like a thousand views. And so why are we co covering Velma? Uh, we're doing it definitely for the clicks, but also because Alan was tasked with doing it. But that also means in a bet, I have to see next week. I have to see magic Mike. Yeah. I have to see the magic Mike movie. That that vote wasn't even close. <laughs> no, it wasn't even close. People are like, Gore deserves it. He's got to go because Alan's being tortured with Velma. Yeah, I think we got over a thousand votes, and uh, over sixty percent went to you. <laughs> fine, fine. It's not. I don't need a recount. I accept. I accept the results of this election. Uh, but that also means, I mean, you got you got to review Velma, but I have to review. Magic Mike. I will go see Magic Mike so you don't have to. But Alan, tell us about the latest episodes of Velma. Okay, well, I think it's appropriate to start here. All right. So let's talk about Velma. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've used this, I've used this a lot. Uh, I've said it's a bad improv show. Uh, I've been doing improv comedy for almost, well, oh, geez, 95, early 90s. So is that 30 years? That's been 30 years. Yeah, Not to say that I'm any expert in it, or, uh, or, but I've done it a long time, and I, I have a feeling I know what works and what doesn't. But I've seen, my, I've, I've seen more than my fair share of bad improv shows. And, and I, uh, I like... I'll describe it this way. You know, you have two people come on stage and instantly in the minds of both of those people, there's this pressure to be funny. And so they have to say something funny. They, mm -hmm. they have to say something weird. And then the other person feels like, oh, I got to one up that. So they've got to say something weird. And it just becomes this uh, two people trying to say weird things, funny things for, for five minutes. And it just, it, it goes nowhere. And you're just kind of sitting there groaning, and um, and to me, that's that's kind of the state of improv comedy, I think. Uh, and I, I think this has been built up over over the last few decades, where you know people just you know, it, it's this idea that that you know I just need to say funny things constantly, and there was only one person who could do that, and that was Robin Williams, and even sometimes he he didn't do it right, and. Um, and that's that's the feeling I get watching Velma episode seven and eight. It's just a constant stream of inane jokes, uh, of funny sayings, of 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 callbacks and cultural references that we don't care about. And uh, it, it started from episode one. It's continued to episode eight. Um, and I will say, uh, I think I think seven, episode seven and eight are my favorite because it it. Wells, it, it brings this feeling of, hey, there's only two more episodes left, and and I only have one more week to, to do this, and so, so I will say, um, the series has gotten better only because it's almost over, um, so let's go quickly, um, episode seven, um, so what's happening now is, uh, the killer is still on the loose, um, there's a, uh, they they've discovered that it's a ghost. Or, or at least that's what the police are saying. They're, they're saying it's not a serial killer; it's a ghost. So everybody can go out and have a party, and the party is the Crystal Cove Fog Festival. And um, and here, uh, in order to protect everybody, women have to show up with a date. So single men can show up, women can show up, but they have to have a date. And Velma realizes that she needs to go to this to protect people, and the only way she can do it is to dress as a man. And uh, and by dressing as a man, she discovers the wonders and glories of male privilege, and uh, that's that's the episode here. Let, let's uh, let's talk about a few lines here. Um, let's see, uh, Fred must be the oh uh, okay. So another side story is that Fred has to win Fog King in order to stay in the good graces of his family, and so he can keep his money going. Um, so here's here's some great lines from. Uh, episode seven uh let's see oh uh what is it oh i'm sorry i'm reading i'm oh yeah so okay so forget it i'm not gonna do i'm not gonna read lines um so so yeah so it's the glories of velma trying to learn what it's like to be a man how great it is to be a man and of course she has bad things to say about it um 
Oh yeah. So, so here's some, uh, sorry, sorry. I'm all over the place here, but uh, <laughs> I know I had to do it this morning because obviously I was busy yesterday. Uh, yeah. So some lines are like drunker than a cool babysitter. And there you go. Uh, okay. As a guy. Oh yeah. So when she talks about male privilege, she says, as a guy, there's so little consequences for their actions. Ha ha ha. Um, and oh, and by the way, it, it ends with the Scooby-Doo stupid, stupid chase through a bunch of doors. You know how they'll enter one door. And oh, one I, side. I, I, yeah, that was a staple of the original Scooby-Doo. Yeah. And so there you go. They, they're they at least honoring Scooby-Doo. Uh, mm -hmm. Episode eight. Again, we're getting closer uh, here. Uh, Velma and Daphne. Uh, it basically explores more of Velma and Daphne's friendship. Uh, and uh, they get stuck in a uh, in a cave. Uh, they're they're pressed in by these rocks. Um, you know, they and then and then what happens in this one is it's a series of flashbacks, and they do this horrible title sequence, uh, title gag. You know, they'll they'll say uh, Daphne's flashback taking place at the time Velma, and uh, it, it just goes on. It's this joke that's not funny, doesn't make sense, but they just press really hard into it. Um, so Daph uh, Velma has to convince Daphne to go into the woods to find, um, to find, uh, Fred who's been missing. And, uh, at one point, and, and as to coax Daphne out there, she says, I brought your favorite snacks. It's water and a picture of Tom Holland. What? A picture of, a picture of Tom Holland. That, that sounds like an improv comedy bad line. That's exactly. It's um, terrible, man. Let's see. Oh, oh, here we go. Uh, there's a killer in the woods or a celebrity on a social media cleanse. Cleanse. See, this sounds like jokes. Someone said it before in a review, and I forget who it is. They said the, the dialogue in Velma sounds like comedian, comedy writers talking to other comedy writers. Yeah. That's what well, it that's, sounds like. I mean, that's that's an improv show. It's, it's comedians uh, trying to one-up each other. Uh, trying yeah. to, trying to come up with every reference possible. It, it's, you know, the, those people who who you know you you meet them at a party and they have to say something funny all the time. So yeah, you say yeah, something yeah. funny and they'll respond with a funny joke in line. And well, that's, that's why kind of, I feel you know, that like, sounds like absolute torture. It is, and that's that's the series, you know. And oh, and God. again, I, I I painted it last week. The writers' room, they write a joke. Well, they write they write a basic script. And then they have to add jokes to it. So here's a line. Oh, we need to add, we need to uh, enhance that line with a joke. Uh, and then when they come up with uh, some kind of weird reference, uh, they'll high five each other and say, "Great job." Yeah. Oh, yeah, here's a good one. Uh, no one. Um, oh yeah. So uh, I think this was from Daphne. Uh, no, this is from from uh, from Shaggy. Or sorry, Norval. Uh, he says, "No one knows my heart more than me." And Mary J. Blige. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, it, and that's the thing is uh, that joke stands just like, like I said. There's there's no context to it other, you know. Okay, so what does Mary J. Blige have to do with this? I mean, again, I, I looked at I looked at the writers, and they're all you know associated with uh, with Mindy Kaling. They wrote mm -hmm. on the Mindy Kaling show. They wrote on their last few shows. Some wrote for the office, wrote with her for the office, and uh, and so there's just this this humor vacuum that that's clearly Mindy and her friends, uh, and you know they I bet they sit around all the time joking with each other and said hey hey let's we should make a TV show, uh, in fact let's do Scooby Doo uh, I'll 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 march into the room, uh, you know as a as a BIPOC they have to give it to me. Uh, and they can they can't criticize us because that'll be racism, and uh, and this is the show we get from it. And uh, yeah, uh, there's two more episodes left, and, and, <laughs> and we're gonna find out we're gonna find out who the killer is. Uh, and, oh yeah, I should mention I'm gonna spoil episode eight for you. Uh, they find the brains of the girls who have died, and uh, and they're set up in these these jars uh, with speakers, and they can talk. And uh, and Fred winds up having sex with all three of the brains. So, uh, wait, yeah. what? How do you have sex with the brains? Well, he, I think he more makes out with the brains than he does have sex with it. But, but the implication is that, um, 
you know, uh, that, that Fred is cheating on the other brands with the with with the brains. None of none of this makes sense. Nothing yeah. you've said has made me want to watch a, yeah. a minute of an episode. But I cannot wait next week, Alan. The <laughs> series, the yeah, it's the season season finale because I don't know. It has not been officially announced that it's been yeah. picked up. Yeah. So it, if if we're if the humanity is lucky, it'll be the series finale next week. <laughs> If if it's lucky, or they could spread it out, they could just do one episode and then another episode. So, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, um, that would be great. Yeah. All right, let's um let's go to our chat comments and questions here. We've got a lot of them. Matthew Hammond comes in with a super chat for four ninety nine. Says, "Are all the writers women on Velma? How do we get Velma to get a second season?" <laughs> well, no, it's they're not all women. Um, in fact, uh, yeah. I, like I said, they're all they're all friends of hers from from all the other projects. I I think she did some like Secret Life of College, uh, the Sex Lives of College Students, something like that, which mm -hmm. I can't imagine is sexy at all. I think it's the Sex Lives of College Girls. Yeah. College okay, but yeah. I, I can't imagine that's you know it's a provocative title, but I can't imagine you're gonna you're gonna you know that that has anything real to say about. Well, the by sex the way, the, the only reason I remember the title is because it's a good title. And then mm -hmm. I saw the billboard and say, yeah, I'm not watching that show. I have no interest. Yeah. Another super chat comes in from Swords and Starships for 15. Says, Chris and Alan, you're in my top five channels on YouTube. Your chill, balanced reviews are better than Siskel and Ebert. Helped inspire me to launch my channel, Swords and Starship. Starships, countdown music or gore rant, please. <laughs> there may be a gore rant later. Um but congratulations, and I'll check out Swords and Starships. That is yeah, a, go, go subscribe that is a yeah. good title for a YouTube channel. Well, thank you. And Swords and Starships is also a member. Uh, appreciate that. That's awesome. Um, going to more chat comments about this episode. SWD40 says, bring back the Globetrotters. I used to watch that Globetrotters show. I used to, I used to see the Globetrotters every year. <laughs> I never got to see them, but I would see the commercials that they were coming to town. But I watched the cartoon show, and I actually really loved the cartoon show. I love that was the first cartoon show ever to feature characters of color. Um, now it's weird. I love when they try to like tout like, and it's just like, wait, did my childhood, my childhood, I don't remember any of this being a first. I watched so much quote diverse. I didn't think of it as diverse. I was like, I just watched the things that I thought were funny. Yeah, I watched a lot. I watched a lot of stuff that I guess now it's like, oh, uh, I guess we were diverse in the seventies. I'm aging myself. Yeah, no, we. Uh, my friends and I, we used to go see the Globetrotters every year. I grew up in South Central, or I was born in South Central LA, mm -hmm. and um, you know, you know, you talk about race. It was like for kids, it was never about race. It was about really cool basketball, and and funny jokes. Yeah, I, they were like acrobats. I mean, the Globetrotters. I mean. I'm sure there are clips of the cartoon on YouTube. Check it out. Murdoch 86 says this show was made to inspire others to do better. I actually think that that's a thing. Like, mm -hmm. like I actually think there's something to be learned from, you know, some people say, why are you still covering this stuff? It's so bad. And it's like, no, it's important. First of all, it's important to know about, but secondly, it's also important because it should inspire you. It sh if a show like this can get on television, that should inspire you. But mm -hmm. you need to, I, I feel like, you want to aspire to do better than this because yeah. I really think this sounds lazy more than anything else. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Halo, there's, there's nothing, uh, I'll just say there's nothing. If you want to, if you're an aspiring screenwriter, there's nothing to better than seeing something bad and f trying to figure out why it's not working. I, I will tell you the main reason this show doesn't work is because none of the characters are likable. You know, the, the, the key to get people to watch your sh TV show is to have is to find a way to connect an audience with your character with with at least at minimum your lead character right and and right. you're unable to do that here because she is not a good person she's a annoying person um you know any attempt that she has to do good is still done out of selfishness and out of uh and, and then she's constantly on this everyone's on this moral outrage just woke outrage and um you know it, and it's not that you have to create a likable character here. I think Curb Your Enthusiasm, Larry David, is the prime example of an unlikable character that we like. 
Uh, and and the reason that show works compared to this one is Larry David always gets it in the end. You know, all his yeah. all the bad things he does, uh, he gets re- he gets uh, revenge taken on him somehow. He gets he has to go into accountability for the actions he's he's done by the end of the show. And I think that's why that show works in terms of unlikable characters. Russ Man with a ten dollars super chat says, "Happy Friday, gents! Hail to FT and the Fellowship." Thank you. And oh, this is exciting. The Joker Ooh. just became a YouTube member. Well, welcome, Joker. Welcome. We will not judge you because of your past. Jinx says, uh, it's talking to Pip Boy Gamer, says, welcome to Hollywood 2023. Thank you, Jinx. Gus won the Three Stooges door trope. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, does a talking shark count as diversity says thomas pickett for two are you talking about jabberjaw is it jabberjaw was jabberjaw the shark yeah I'm trying to remember and also yeah, jabberjaw captain, is the shark. in fact uh frank welker is in this series uh captain Cave- his dad. and captain caveman i believe was in that group keeping it very diverse yes which i love and, that and and don't forget dino mutt <laughs> dino mutt i love dino mutt <laughs> Oh man, I'm gonna go down a rabbit hole of cartoons. Swords and Starships says Alan, your sheer de- des- despairing weariness as you describe the show says it all. Well, I can't wait till next week. I cannot wait until yeah, next I can't week. wait either. Jordan C. Bond, how dare they use the door trope? I actually don't mind the door trope, but maybe do something different with it. John but the problem Hill- was is not only did they use this is another bad thing you do in comedy, they use the door trope and then they call it out. As you know, they, they're saying you're so stupid that you don't even remember this was a trope in, in the original series. And so they have to point it out to you. Right. John Manalang, who's a member, John, always good to run into you. I've run into you recently. I don't know. I haven't been on the West Side. You're doing great, Alan. Mirrors the amount of effort that went into Velma. <laughs> and Jordan C. Bond is chat GPT writing the script, assembling words that should be funny but aren't. I am told. We need to have a conversation about chat and GPT because we've actually discussed the idea of having using an AI tool to pre-write our news, then rewriting it to make sure that it's factually accurate and in the style of film threat writing. But yeah. I keep seeing reports that chat GPT is politically biased. Is it? So, yeah. Um, well, in, in terms of news, um, it I tried it. And? Uh, and? It only goes back, uh, the information from the last two years is not available on chat GPT. Oh, and it's well, not updated with new new items. So you, it's not like you could write in a news report or something that happened yesterday. Uh, you could do a, you can say, you know, talk, talk to me about, about Watergate, you know, right. or talk to me about, uh, what was it, the um, Marlon Brando and the, the right. Academy Award, you know, winning that one. Well, chat GPT is more experimental at this point. I mean, there's yeah. more... Um, there's there are other AI tools and we're being pitched them all the time. It's something we might try, but I think what we would do is do a disclaimer that this was supplemented by AI. So it's punishment, not comedy, says imperfect. And Raylo Normie says these are the most narcissistic people Absolutely. ever. Um, and uh Jinx says chat GPT is generic, it's PC politically correct. It will not stay long. Well, good. Um, yeah, no, I, I've seen people do experiments. One of the interesting experiments is someone said, write a poem about President Joe Biden. And ChatGPT wrote like this really nice poem about the president. And then the someone then just asked it, please, you know, write a poem about, you know, former President Donald Trump. And it, and it said, oh, I'm sorry, we can't do that. So every time you tested it one side or the other, it was very weird. And I thought, oh, well, this is worthless. You know, if you're if you're only going to cater to one side, what's the point? I'd like something that is, you know, agnostic or just politically unbiased. So there you are. Um, Hey, uh, real quick. Wait, I'm going to I'm going to pivot for a second. We're just going to we're going to pivot for one second. You know, you know what they say. They, you know what they say. They're just, you know, you gotta. <laughs> Real quick, I got a, I got a giant package in the mail from Matthew Murphy, from, uh, from North Carolina, 
who sent this incredibly complimentary note. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity to share with you how much I have enjoyed watching the hijinks of Alan uh, and yourself on, a, on the biweekly basis since I learned of Film Threat via the algorithm. Can you believe it? A glimpse of hope. <laughs> um, after beginning to, and then it goes on, just really kind words from Matthew Murphy. He sent a package of lights to redo uh, my setup here and then sent me some steps. I just mailed out, Matthew, a package to you uh, with a whole bunch of stuff. I'm not going to say. I'm going to leave it a surprise, but a really kind note. I just want to thank him for, for this for this letter here. It's a, it's, it's a longish letter. I'm not going to read it. Uh, yeah. Giant package. Uh, so uh, just appreciate when you send a physical, physical pack. And, and also, by the way, we like to give away free stuff on the show. I mean, I personally like to give away free stuff. So if you send a self-addressed stamped envelope to film threat, five zero four two Wilshire Boulevard, that's W I L S H I R E Boulevard, Los Angeles, California, nine zero zero three six. You can send me an envelope with stamps already on it addressed to yourself. I'll send you a film threat sticker. Uh, if there's room, I'll throw in a button. I'll, I'll give you free stuff because I always, when I was a kid, I always loved to get free things in the mail um, and and just, just send us an envelope. Send us an empty envelope with postage pre, pre-addressed to you and we will send that out to you. By the uh, way, we forgot someone. Uh Grape Ape, how could we I know? I loved Grape Ape. Grape Ape was the best. Love it. Love it. All right. Uh, moving right along. But I want to get that in there. He sent this huge package with lights and just like, it was great. It was great. If yeah. I can't use them, Alan, I'll give them to you. Oh, absolutely. Cool. And you're very close, Alan. Um, I promised Alan, I promise, and I will follow through on this promise. I will give Alan a PS5 once he completes painting the room and kind of redoing it. And I actually have some lights I can give you, Alan, for okay. your setup. And we're going to do, Alan's going to do a live stream where you can watch him paint the room. Yeah, you literally wait, wait ass room. the entire time. That's <laughs> You're basically going to, well, you should try to figure out like some sort of microphone so you can still like answer questions or something. Yeah. During they all have my kid kind of moderating things. So uh... You can have your kid maybe off camera though. Yeah. Um, we don't we don't want any harassment situation to come up, but uh, that that's going to be a lot of fun. And I promise, uh, I, I promise I'll come through with the PS5. But yeah. you got to paint that room and do a redo. Yeah. Some of the some of the stuff in the background. If people have requests of which should be removed, let Alan know. Yeah. So because Alan is, well, you want me to keep the uh, last last uh, Rise of Skywalker poster there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The last Rise of Skywalker. Oh my <laughs> yeah. god. I know. I oh, wish there was a better way to. To mount these uh, comic books too. There's a uh, Bill Sienkiewicz, uh New Mutants right there. Oh, nice. Yeah. You can use there's. I mean, look, there's stuff you can get. There's usually duct tape that works pretty well as long as it doesn't damage your walls. But there you go. I like that you're in a, yeah. your daughter's old bedroom. That is literally the stuff from when your daughter was like a little little kid. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, the the choice of pink was my wife's choice. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Okay. This, this thing here, I don't even want to show you what that is. <laughs> what is it? It's a it's a costume closet and it's very pink. Is that for like improv and stuff? No, it's for princess dresses for my daughter. Okay, you had to specify for your daughter. Yeah, for my daughter. Okay, good. Well, that's good to hear. They don't they don't make princess dresses my size. All right. Let's uh let's pivot and uh, let's talk about Knock at the Cabin. Knock at the Cabin is an M. Night Shyamalan movie. And I think a lot of people have mixed feelings about M. Night Shyamalan. Some movies they have really loved. Of course, The Sixth Sense, I think, is universally beloved. Uh, one of the best Bruce Willis movies, along with Die Hard, um, who introduced Haley Joel Osment. Such a great performance in that film it's got the twist ending and M night Shyamalan is kind of known for his twist endings. I happen to like, and I know this is might seem controversial. I actually really like the movie signs with Mel Gibson. I enjoyed, um, and he's made other movies, you know, uh, you know, uh, last airbender, other things that were kind of had mixed reaction. 
Uh, I think also people universally really like Unbreakable and then people didn't like Glass. I would say that M. Night Shyamalan kind of has um, a 50-50 record, uh, but I like him more often than not. I think when when Shyamalan does a really good job, uh, he, he knows how to tell a scary story. You can see, and in particular in this movie, you can really see the Alfred Hitchcock influences. Um, in addition to an M night cameo, he does a cameo in all of his movies. This is probably the best M night cameo he's ever done. Yes. It involves, uh, you know, I'm not going to ruin it. It's just funny. It's funny. It didn't take me out of the scene at all. It's just like, I really love that he's committed to putting himself in every film. And I think that's great. Um, if you've seen the trailer, you know, the setup, a group of people who, who just show up at a cabin, with um, a, a gay married couple who have a young daughter. Her name is Wen. They are uh, Daddy Andrew and Daddy Eric. That's how she refers to them. And it's based on a novel uh, uh, by the same name, Knock at the Cabin. And what I love, not to, we're not going to get too much into the story because frankly, the trailer, if you've seen it, kind of tells you everything you need to know. For random people show up at this cabin where this family is on a on you know idyllic vacation getaway and they're confronted with a choice they must choose to sacrifice one member of their family to save the planet to save the earth from the apocalypse and some plague will be unleashed each time they refuse to make that choice that is the basic story I, 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 I saw, I've seen the movie twice. I saw it with you, Alan, on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I saw it again last night with our movie meetup group. I happen to really enjoy this film. I'll tell, I'll tell you the reasons I enjoyed it. Uh, movie doesn't waste any time. You would think with a film like this, like, oh, we're going to spend like the first 20 minutes of the movie getting to know this family and getting to care about them. No, the movie begins right away immediately in this incredibly haunting scene where this, the young, I don't know the name of the young actress who plays when, she is phenomenal. She is spectacular in this role. Children are always like, uh, always a risk, right? Haley Joel Osment really worked out in The Sixth Sense. I mean, he was, that was a great performance. You were convinced. Uh, the young girl who plays when, and I saw like video footage of her on the red carpet. She's, she's pretty hilarious. But in this, it's such an intense performance. She's out in the woods collecting grasshoppers by herself and she is approached by a large man named Leonard. He introduces himself as Leonard, uh, played by Dave Bautista. This is the best acting Dave Bautista's ever done. He's something of a gentle giant. And the first like five, 10 minutes of the movie is him just talking to this girl. And it's the most intense conversation. They have this like subtle conversation. They're talking about their lives. They're getting to know each other so they'll be friends. It's this sort of stranger danger situation. It's such a great opening scene. And that's what I love about this movie is it doesn't, it doesn't waste time with the like, let's get to what we already know is going to happen. It just starts in the very first theme, scene in the very first like minute of the movie. Boom, we're off to the races. And also uh, a shout out and praise to the running time. It's an hour and 40 minutes. You're in, you're out. It doesn't overstay its welcome. It's not two hours and 20 minutes. That's not an ideal running time. Um, and, and I think that that actually played into also my enjoyment of the film. Uh, once it introduced to the concept, uh, you know, you get to know actually the characters, Eric and Andrew, you get to know them through flashbacks. You see how they came to adopt when, how they became a family, how they, you know, went through troubles in the marriage, but decided to stay together. And, uh, you know, that stuff is all very heartwarming. It's very charming. And what I like, you know, you just, you get to know them in the way that like makes a lot of sense. You also get to know through their own words, the four people who have come to, you know, basically drop this news on them. It's very biblical, although they don't ever reference the Bible. That's actually kind of a complaint that I have about the film is that it doesn't overtly or uh, directly quote the Bible at all. And I think that's what made 
That's what made like other horror films like The Exorcist and The Omen so frightening is like, oh yeah, that's really in the Bible. And I feel like the movie would have been more powerful had they done that. Uh, but I, I, I really enjoyed uh, Knock at the Cabin, you, especially because M. Night, his camera work is just masterful. The way that like most of the movie takes place just at the cabin and it doesn't ever feel claustrophobic because the camera is moving around. It moves from room to room. It moves outside the cam and it does a lot of things in one shot. Also the way that like M night is really good, which is what Hitchcock kind of taught people is how to like tell, tell a story using the cinematic language, which is a series of a shot plus B shot plus C shot equals X emotion telling telling a story with and not images that involve people because that's sort of the cheap way of doing it. Right. You, you read the emotion on the person's face. That's how I'm supposed to feel. He shows this with inanimate objects and doorknobs. And it's incredibly frightening, even when people are not on screen to kind of project how you're supposed to feel. Um, Hitchcock was good at that. And, and M night is really good at that. And I thoroughly enjoyed the film. Look, is it the greatest movie ever? No. Is it the greatest horror movie ever? No. We might see better horror films this year. Um, but it is scary, frightening. There are um, there are some jump scares, but they're not cheap ones. I think any, any jump scare involving a cat is a cheap one. That's a cheap jump scare. Uh, but I, I, I really, I really like the film. It's, you know, in the M night, it's sort of like, I would say that it's, it's uh, on the better of M night films. And I do admit that they vary. He's hit or miss. And for me, this was a hit. I actually think they gave away a little too much in the trailer. And I have more thoughts, but I want to hear what you want yeah. you have to say, Alan. What did you think of, Not of Knock at the Cabin? Yeah. No, I think the funny thing was when we saw it together, uh, I brought my daughter. Mm -hmm. And she was the first vocal person to speak out. And she basically, I hated this movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, it, you know, and, and, and it's you, me, and Eric. And we're kind of looking at each other going, no, we actually like this movie. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like the movie. Um, I, I, in terms of, for me, it's, it's you said, you said it, it's, it is, this is the classic definition of the roller coaster where it just gets, it starts right off the bat. They, they pull the lever and, and it's the girl in the woods when, and then Dave Batista shows up and we're off to the races and uh and it just ratchets up you know it starts you know this it, it's i guess why we like this movie is it's this mystery and we just kind of see it unravel and it just becomes more intense more intense more intense as it goes along and, and then you get to the ending and, and you realize up until this point there really have not been any flaws in it uh we're engaged in the story and we're, we're having a good time I think my only complaint I, you brought it up is the lore of it. I mean, um, the, the minor spoiler, but it's you know everyone's driven by dreams, and that's kind of why the motivation is is here. But but you know it, I think it would help to kind of understand the a little bit of the backstory behind it, the lore behind that, and then you know, it, and also it's based on a book, so uh, you know there's there's certain things that that can find M Night at that point. Um, and, and I, but the the only real complaint I have is the movie is, I'll describe it as a as a mighty river. Uh, it flows and no one can, no one can change its direction. And so it goes, it, you know, it's kind of like each event logically moves to the next event. And um, and I kind of you know, and so it it makes the film somewhat predictable. And and I'll leave it as at that because I, I do think you do need to experience this movie, uh, with with as little. Um, you know, with it's with the only information basically from the from the trailers um you know and I, I mentioned it on Wednesday but I think the gay love story in this one is much stronger than than the last of us and we we could talk about that uh because well, I had some thoughts on that one yeah I, I I will I'll address uh some of what you said um like I I I just I just like the the fact that um these are all well-rounded characters yeah you know they're they're the the um the people who knock at the cabin uh are on a mission that they they are have have uh they don't want to do what they're what they're doing yeah uh, maybe with the exception of uh the guy what was his name um the guy played by rupert grint oh redmond 
Redmond, yeah. Okay, Rupert Grint is in this movie from the Harry Potter films. And he is not like, first of all, when we first watched it, the first time I saw it, I didn't even realize it was him because he's covered <laughs> in a beard. He sort of plays this like hick, you know, and he's, Southerner, yeah, yeah, it's, you know, uh, a, an unlikable character. And it wasn't till the end. It's like, oh my God, that was Rupert Grint. He really, really went out of his way to like talk differently. Yeah. Ron Weasley, people are saying in the chat, like it's, it's, um, he's, he's really good because that's, that's what acting is. You are not, um, mm -hmm. he's not like himself, but I will say, I, I do like these, you know, the, the gay couple in this, first of all, the movie's not about them being gay. They just happen to be a gay couple. The yeah. second thing is, what I think is interesting is they're not a stereotypically gay couple. In fact, I would go so far as to say, and this could this could um, apply actually even to The Last of Us, it's interesting to see a gay married couple who probably are conservatives. Okay. There are all these little clues there's the typical gay or the almost the stereotypical type of gay person, which was in the movie bros, which I took one for the team there. I just want to remind everybody. <laughs> and, uh, I went to see bros. Yes. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> yeah. Come on. That's why you're doing Velma, but no, but like, um, really, if you look at like the way the characters dress, they have a, they're gun owners. They're going out and you know, they're they're not going to West Hollywood to party at Mickey's, right? They're yeah. they're like, you know, they're they're doing things that are not stereotypically gay that you might actually associate with people who happen to be more conservative. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's two gay cup two gay men who want to have a child. I mean, how much how much more grounded do you get in terms of a relationship and, and, a, and an intimate married relationship than than wanting that you know? yeah and, and, and they do go through the extraordinary steps to have to do it as a gay couple yeah well it's like look look it's 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 to me it's all about the story that's sort of the the background but i like that they're not like a a a this is this is disney cannot get gay characters right they just sort of like, and they're gay. It's like, no, yeah. like they're well-rounded people. It shouldn't be the first, the first attribute of a character because Eric and Andrew are very different as people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one is yeah. very almost like buttoned up dresses and is kind of a little bit standoffish. Um, he goes to jump in the lake, but takes his shoes off and puts his phone in his shoe. Whereas, you know, his daughter went and, and, um, and Eric. Oh no, and Andrew. Yeah, Andrew, like they just go and jump, and he's like, oh, I'm gonna take things a little, you know. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, like I have to say that 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 this is one of the great things about this movie is you know, you have what seven characters, and they're all distinct from one another. It's yeah. the, it's a master class in character development. So you don't have characters who are too similar, you know, you don't and, and they're not necessarily stereotypical, which is you know, subverting expectations, I suppose. Um, but you know, every single character is distinct, has their own personality and motivations for why they are in this story. And again, that's, that's what you need when you tell stories is being able to create characters that, that have life and that are not, you know, that, that, that has something unique about them, uh, that, that we can connect with and that, or that we can learn from. The, the other thing to talk about in this is Dave Batista's performance. I mean, all the actors are very good. This is the best performance Dave Bautista's ever put on screen. He is someone he even says, like, uh, he's better than The Rock. Uh, I would agree, Derek Rosenfeld. He's much better actor than The Rock. I feel like The Rock in every movie is The Rock. Dave Bautista in this movie is different than Dave Bautista in uh, Blade Runner 2049. Is different than him as Drax in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. Dave Bautista, best thing he has ever done. He plays against type um, and he's a well-rounded character. It's revealed that he is, you know, a teacher who teaches second grade um, and he does, you know, after school uh, program. He coaches uh, a team after school and also bartender for extra money. Like uh, Dave Bautista is so good in this. He's this well-rounded character who takes no pleasure in doing what he must do um and let's, let's be real though he's not gonna win an oscar for this role 
He's not going to win an um, Oscar, but because yeah, does... his character has somewhat of a wall, which keeps him emotionally, you know, he has to maintain a kind of emotional detachment from the situation, uh, right? Allowing moments to, and you know, and uh, I'll probably get murdered for this, but no, I, th I think as actors, it's easy to play emotionally detached. <laughs> Well, I mean, he's compartmentalized, and I feel yeah. like that's that he knows he has to yeah. do that. He mm -hmm. has to do that right. in order, and, and to he do does it. He does it well. But the, the question is, can he do a real dramatic role? And yeah. and I don't. You're not going to get that from this, this movie. Yeah. Well, and to, to be clear, we're not getting into any spoilers mm -hmm. at all um, with this film. And there's no, I stayed for the, the credits are actually pretty cool because there's this like animation that is throughout it. There's no post-credit scene. Um, and, and. Uh, yeah, you should probably end it there. <laughs> I should probably end it there. But, yeah. I'll, but I'll just say that, I'll just say that um, I really enjoyed the film. You mm -hmm. like horror and you like M. Night. You will like it. And you'll like finally seeing gay characters on the screen, on the screen, not in a stereotypical way. But I would argue that the characters in this, without overtly saying it out loud, they are conservative. They because because in this just yeah. by looking at how they dress, the the professions that they chose, uh, the fact that they chose to raise a family, the fact that they're gun owners, the fact that when they go on a vacation, they're not going to woo party it up in Miami. They're actually going like out in the woods. I, I would argue that the characters in this, and I would argue that Bill. A uh, conservative character, so it's nice to see that like characters not playing like a stereotypical because it would just be so easy to take a gay character and make them a liberal, right? Like that's just that is to me that they have an axe to grind that they have, right? Uh, you know, you know, they have you know, hangups that they have to deal with. I mean, I, I would say that that Eric and Andrew are, are probably representative of the of my gay friends, you know. Um, you know, I, I have three three couples who have children, and they're very much like this. They're for all intended purpose, they're they're like you and me. Um, and I don't necessarily hang out with the the West Hollywood uh, gay types. Um, it's just you know people who are gay, and but but you'd never know it until unless they told you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like um, look uh, when I <clears throat> when I made this movie, my big fat independent movie years ago. It was private investment from a, a gay married couple, and they were like staunch conservatives. <laughs> they were because basically, I think because they have a lot of money, um, and they they invested in in this movie that I made, and they were just very conservative. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to say they were boring, but you 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 know, they were just like you know, just conservative gay married couple. And I think there is more of that that exists than maybe you might you might guess. Yeah, um, I, I don't know that I would call them conservative, but they're not. Again, they don't have an axe to grind. Well, they're you know, not not a they, stereotype. They deal, they deal with homophobia, um, and you know, but he goes about it in a very you know two way way. You know, I need a gun. <laughs> I need to protect my family. Right, right. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, no. Look, I, I enjoyed the film. And, and like, look, we were, we we're standing outside, like talking about the movie after. And, um, you know, it's like, I say, like, look, not every movie is, and just to explain why I enjoyed the film, I enjoyed the film because look, I got to check out for, you know, almost two hours and just have a, a, a story play out and, and, and enjoy it with a, with a large group of people packed screening. But, um, not every movie is a home run. Not every movie is the greatest movie ever because I go to the movies every week, right? It's like not every meal can be filet mignon. You get sick of filet mignon. Sometimes you just need some fast food or sometimes you just need a microwave burrito, okay? Uh, but, you know, and this is the movie that's like that. It's like, you'll be entertained. I had a good time. Um, I, I, I got into the characters. And there you go. Um, the chat is divided here uh, on, on a bunch of different things. We're going to go to your chat comments and questions as related to this. So let's go. Uh, Jinx says, Knock at the Cabin was good, but not great. Batista's performance was really good. Jinx, yeah. I would agree with that. I'm not sitting here trying to tell you. It's like a six and a half or, you know, 
maybe a seven, but I'd say six and a half is probably the right, um, the right rating yeah. for this out of 10 out of 10. Yeah. I mean, I, I think um, it's not your typical M night movie because it is an adaptation of an existing story. Right. Um, so there are, there are constraints there that he uh, quite admirably decides, I'm just going to tell this story, but tell it in my way. And right. so it's not, you know, it, it doesn't have certain traditional M night uh, elements to it. Right. Shuxi says, I liked signs too. Yeah. Well, there you go, Shuxi. And also, Shuxi, do you have a mask in your profile pic? <laughs> Is that a mask in your profile pic? So. I'm going to, all right. I'm going to. See that or a bandana. And, uh... What is that, Shuxi? I don't know. You might need to fix that, Shuxi. <laughs> Brock Samsonite says, can we all just admit Dave Batista needs to stop trying to convince us he's a serious guy already? No, it, it's fine. I actually don't have a problem with it. Yeah. I, I mean, He's he he can do serious, but he can also do Drax, which is a comedic role. Patrick Lemire knock has a great poster, very much in the style of Saul Bass, who worked a lot with Hitchcock. Actually, if you go to the Film Threat Instagram, it's just Film Threat on Instagram. Um, that is the alt poster, and uh, I post I the Film Threat Instagram is just weird Allen videos. And also I'm in those videos sometimes weird stuff about what's going on with film. And it's just movie posters. Yeah. Why? Because I love movie posters. And so I like to feature very weird ones or ones you might not have heard of from movies you've never heard of, but um, yeah, check out the film threat Instagram to get a look at that poster. Derek Rosenfeld says Batista is greater than the rock. Agree. And Jink says the rock is a one note pony. Batista has range. Please don't compare them together. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I like The Rock, but I like The Rock. I don't know. He can mm -hmm. play a different character. And I think Black Adam is probably the most different from The Rock he's ever played. But uh, uh, yeah. what? I, I mean, he plays it. He plays it more serious and more kind of a melancholy. But, uh, you know, it's still superhero rock in the end. Aaron Taylor. What's the twist? Here's the twist. For this movie, okay, and get ready. The twist is there's no twist. <laughs> That's the twist. I mean, there are some twists, but it's not like a changing your perception of the entire movie right. type of twist, which is what M. Night is known for, right. right? Like you're changing your perception, like everything you've seen is different than what you thought you saw. Yeah. I mean, if you remember the happening is that is that's the Mark Wahlberg one, right? The happening. Yeah, yeah, with the tree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the twist was barely a twist in that one. Yeah, it was more of a, you know, hey, it's happening somewhere else now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. So he, he's, or, uh, he's kind of varying it up a bit. And or Avatar the, definitely didn't have a twist. What's that one? The Village. The Village. Yeah, I mean that's a twist. Six cents. That's a twist. <laughs> right, right, right. But but here's here's what here's what I'll defend M Night. He makes really good Twilight Zone episodes. And like every Twilight Zone episode, there are the good ones, the ones that are just okay. And I, I loved the Twilight Zone as a kid. I grew up watching it. Um, every, I believe it's every 4th of July, there's like a, um, they do like a marathon, a 4th, of, uh, like a 4th of July, like Twilight Zone marathon. And I love it. I actually have all the episodes of the Twilight Zone. Um, so uh, yeah. I don't know, just... Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll say this about it, M. Night is that he 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 is great at bringing tension to the unknown. Yes. You don't know what's going to happen. And and the way he builds that tension is, is just masterful. And that, to me, that's trademark M. Night. Well, again, if you like the Twilight Zone, you're probably a fan mm -hmm. of M. Night because I feel he's very yeah. influenced by Twilight Zone. What does he do? He takes a Twilight Zone type of premise, extends it to feature length, and, and tells a story. Yeah. And he gets in and out. I feel like he also respects the audience. Um, and uh, I, I don't know. I just, yeah. Well, I, I, had, I had a good time. Yeah. I mean, I think M. Night's failures all have to do a story and, and not filmmaking. And, and I think that's just, you know, and that's why he's hit or miss because sometimes his stories work and sometimes they don't. Right, right. More comments and questions about this film. It seems like a bunch of people in the chat have seen the movie. I know Sifax saw the movie. Swords and Starships. M. Night has been an ever larger disappointment to me with every film after Unbreakable. Well, I would agree yeah. with you. Glass was terrible. 
I did not like, yeah, Glass was like a college film student project. What happened with that movie? Like, Because uh, I think he was confined to this whole idea of the M. Night universe. And, mm. he, and he didn't know how to pull it off. Yeah, it just, um, yeah, Glass was a such a colossal mm. disappointment. Akinika, so like Dave Rubin and David? Yes. What's funny yeah. is they definitely, that, you know, you could, yeah, you could define it as that almost. Yeah, for sure. It's like a Dave Rubin type of couple, which is, this is what I don't like is you take, you make that the biggest attribute. So, um, uh, hang on a sec. Yeah. Well, I'll say that my, my biggest problem with gay stories is that it always feels like being gay means you're a constant horn dog. That, that everything about your life is about sex. Uh, everything about your life is about sexualizing uh, men. Uh, and it, it just, it's like, no, I think gay people have normal lives. You know, they work. Uh, and that they're not thinking about sex 24-7. And, and that's the way I feel like it's portrayed in, in mainstream entertainment. Is that they're always thinking about sex. They're always looking about how to get to be get in bed with some person. Yeah, some guy, yeah. and 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 it's nice to see just a normal couple. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sifax goes on to say, "There's no twist. Twist. It's as straightforward as it tells you." But I think that that's that's kind of the twist. You're expecting a twist. Um, Matthew Hammond, would the movie work with a husband and wife? The husband would sacrifice himself in the first five minutes. That's the thing. I don't know if this story. And look, I I haven't read the the novel. But I would assume that it's like the novel. But I don't know that this story, I think it works. It's more interesting because obviously if it was the husband and wife, the husband would want to make the sacrifice, right? So with this, it's like you're not quite sure. Yeah, but it's so, it's but it's also, are these people legit? Yes. You know, and there's an interplay there. And you wonder if there's, if uh, what the female perspective would be in this idea of, are these people legit or are they crazy? Um, because I I do think you get kind of a male attitude um, from both of them in terms of very logical. They they're thinking through everything very logical at this moment, um, I, until the end, which uh, which honestly the ending, um, it very to me that was my favorite. It's very heart. Uh, there's a lot of emotion and heart behind it, especially about about that couple. And again, I can't say much more about it than that. But I do like I do like that you know, the way they connected with each other at the end of the movie. John Feeder, uh, or Fetter, J Dave Rubin approved. I would say Dave I, Rubin approved. And Sifax says, feels like we saw totally different films, but I know we didn't, Lol. <laughs> Look, here's, here's what I love. I love diversity of opinions. I love diversity of opinions. We can experience things differently. We can come to different conclusions. You could have completely hated it. I know Sifex, you didn't completely hate it, but you didn't love the film, mm -hmm. and that's okay. That's cool. You know, that's uh, that's why I like talking to the chat. We're gonna get we're gonna get different opinions yeah. in the chat, and I love that. Yeah, I mean, like so. we you know we're keep we we're touching upon Last of Us. To me, I'm I'm. I'm confounded by the reaction to it that that this is the that that was the greatest love story ever told, um, and I'm like, eh, it doesn't feels a little no, forced wait, wait. and it feels a little rushed, but it's definitely not the greatest love story ever told. And we'll get to the last. Selling it? Why are we selling it that way right now? We'll get to the last of us. We're, we'll get okay. to the last of us. Uh, Lubitsch, touch me, says comedy is harder than drama, and we know Batista can do both, but is much better at comedy than drama. That's fair. Yeah, fair point. You know, he he's as Drax, where he plays it like completely straight. It's hilarious. I watched the uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy Christmas special, which I thought was awesome, mm -hmm. and it's just a fun, good story. Yeah, and he brought yeah. a lot of emotion to that character. Even. True. Yeah. Wait, Chris and Alan are a gay married couple. Says so imperfect. What? All right. Well, that's news to me. Uh, because well, let's be I, let's 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 let the secret out. We're we're actually in the same house, but different yeah. room. <laughs> oh my god! Uh, Appian says nobody cries like Kevin Smith. Yeah, I find. See, I don't have a problem with Kevin crying, but when I'm at my worst moments and I have wept as a man, 
I have wept. The last thing, the last thing I am thinking about if I weep, which is rare, I don't weep very often, but when I have, I'm not thinking about taking a photo of myself to put on social media. That is the weirdest. I don't know, man. I think TikTok has TikTok and social media has made people into a holes and has, has, has just contributed to mental illness. I think that when studies are done, um, we're going to see, aren't there like proposals now to make sure that like no one under the age of 16 should be using social media? Like it's corrosive to your mental health. And, yeah. and you know, I don't I know if they're at, doing that, but it's, I, I'm all for it. I look at people who I have known like Kevin Smith or, or um, Adam Sessler. And I see the way that they, you know, put themselves out there on social media. And I, I, I feel for them more than anything. I feel for them. Um, and I, I feel like it's the platform itself that is just making people crazy. Uh, so there you go. Nobody cries like Kevin Smith, but like, okay, fine. We all look from a man to another man, men cry, right? I don't cry particularly often. It's for a very good reason if, or when that ever happens, but I don't ever think to take a photo of myself. I don't think as I'm taking the photo, I'm going to put it on social media. That just seems uh, seems weird to me. It seems really, really weird to me. So Toxic Waltz N8 says, I almost squirted at the whale. I find that as old as I get older, it's a little easier to become emotional and I'd like to lean into it more. Toxic Waltz yeah. N8, I hear you. Yeah, there are things like like as I've like reached the and I'm I'm not technically I'm not that old when it comes to old, but um yeah, I look I look at things and I I, pro, I have more of like a sense of peace and calm. Yeah. Uh, even though even though one would think differently if they watch the show, they think I uh, at times can get a little unhinged and angry. Yeah. And, uh, and we should define what you mean by squirted. Um. <laughs> I'm gonna leave that one to you, Alan. <laughs> yeah. We'll leave that to your imagination. I think that's probably gonna end up that's probably gonna end up being isolated. And um, <laughs> why is this not growing? Uh, it's yeah, something like that. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, <laughs> seeing those, it's like, when when did I say that? What was the context? I don't even know. <laughs> somebody, somebody, uh, yeah, and just David, the fact that someone's watching so carefully that that can be a clip, David Glenn who's a member. Thank you for that. They happen to be, they happen to be gay instead of being gay 24, seven, three, six, five. Yeah. That's that. I think the portrayal mm -hmm. in gays, uh, or in gays of gay people in bros, I think is just like, they just leaned into stereotypes. Yeah. Again, it, it was all about sex. It was, it was constantly about sex and, and every, every, every aspect of their life, sex has to be a part of it. And that's, that's the, that was the insufferable part of bros. Well, let's do, let's do like a, uh, let's, uh, we have uh, more comments here. Yeah. Well, oh wait, John Long, last name, who's a member says Romeo and Juliet isn't even the greatest love story ever told. It is tragedy, mm -hmm. which is what the last of us is going to turn into. All roads lead to a five iron. You know, everyone's been saying that I have not played the last of us two. I am only at the very beginning of my journey with the last of us part one, which I will be playing tonight on the, uh, on the PS five. I'll be playing that later tonight. Uh, after I watch FNT, um, <laughs> I'm looking you forward to the same time, that's all I'm saying. What's that? <laughs> you can do it at the same time. That shows like four hours, four or five hours long. Well, no, you kind of need to pay attention to the last of us. Uh, I don't know if oh, I, no, I, oh, I thought you meant FNT. Well, yeah, no, FNT, oh, I okay. kind of just like, I keep on in the background while I'm doing stuff um, and then pay attention whenever they play videos or show memes. But yeah, uh, people have said that. In fact, why don't we talk about The Last of Us Episode 3? We've got, uh, okay, we're going to talk about The Last of Us Episode 3. We're going to talk about 80 for Brady. And then David Desmulchin is joining us on the show. And I can't wait for you all to talk to him. It's going to be great. So let's... Let's um, 
let's let's pivot here. Let's pivot. <laughs> Okay. Uh, here we go. Wait, no, that was a good one. Yeah, uh, the Last of Us episode three. Alan, why don't you tell us about this episode, and then we'll launch into our impressions just briefly. And uh, I, we are going to be talking spoilers. I mean, it's been out since Sunday. It's Friday, mm -hmm. so we're going to assume that you have seen it. Let's talk about this episode, and I think some of the thoughts uh, are going to cross over with this and knock at the cabin. But Alan, tell us briefly about episode three of The Last of yeah, Us. Yeah, so I, I think episode three of The Last of Us can be considered a, a side episode, meaning, uh, you know, it, um, it doesn't, you know, you could cut it out and it, 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 it's not necessarily a, an anchor point to the main story. But that said, it happens in television all the time. We see it in television all the time, so it's not a big deal to me. Um, so Nick Nick Offerman's character, uh, oh, is it is it Bill? Sorry, I should. Yeah, I should Bill. Really okay, so Bill here, he's a he's a survivalist. This is early on in the in the in the pandemic, the uh, the zombie apocalypse, um, and uh, he has set up his home, surround gated it surrounded it uh he he has booby traps everywhere surveillance uh he's bunkered in and he's about to live the rest of his life in complete isolation uh one day this guy frank stumbles along he's he's being chased he's hungry um he uh he he comes up to bill bill doesn't trust him um and somehow bill's defenses are down and he allows frank to come in Gives him a shower, gives him some food, and um, and sends him on the, his way. But uh, in an incident of compassion, decides to let him stay the you know let him stay the night. At which point, um, he find Frank. Frank finds a piano, tries to play it. Uh, Bill takes over, plays the Linda Ronstadt song. They make out. Uh, Bill goes, <laughs> takes a shower, and then um, and then they're both naked. Um, and and so thus begins the love story, and and so from that point on until where we are at the last of us, we we see the the evolution of this relationship, and um, and uh, there's a point in which uh, you know marauders come come on board. Oh, by the way, they meet um, they meet uh, Joel, and uh, Joel and Tess, uh, they strike up kind of a, a relationship, and jo Joel uh, warns him that marauders may be coming, so always be on the lookout. Don't feel safe. Marauders come. Uh, Bill here gets injured, um, and um, and so so this idea that that Bill and Frank are that that as much as they love each other and as much as they are in this kind of paradise, uh, they um, you know it, love doesn't they they you know this idea of happily ever after it's it's a fleeting moment because. Uh, you know, like a good love story, something bad has to happen, and that's what what happens here. And and I'll leave it at that because uh, you know, if you haven't seen it, I, I think it's worth waiting to the end. Um, you know, it, I think what's bothering me most about this is is the hype behind it. Um, because I, I the the day after yesterday and the day before, I'm going on social media, and there's just nothing but post after post that this is the greatest gay love story ever. This is the greatest story ever told, and as much as I like the story, and uh, and I don't really have a problem with the story, um, I just feel like I, I don't know why people are pushing this so hard. And 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 the the conspiracy theorist in me says that uh, you know it's like, um, you know, you know, as much as I I accept gay marriage as as normal in the society, I feel like this is just a hard press to that to convince people that. You know, it feels political in nature as opposed to just telling a story. Um, and the other thing about this story compared to uh, uh, knocking the cabin is that um, this is this is rushed. You know, I, th I think the episode is a little over an hour long, but even that, it's like you know, you have to accept the fact that they're in love and that they're, and so you have this one episode to buy into this love story where where. You know, I feel like love stories need time to breathe, and if they had kind of stretched it out over two or three episodes, 
I think the ending of it uh, would be much more impactful uh, What instead of feeling forced like it was. And um, I don't know. I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm bothered by the way it was presented and the way it's being pushed right now. And it's kind of souring me to, to the story altogether. Well, I, well, again, it's another story. First of all, I really enjoyed this episode. I have a I have a problem with it. It's not the actual episode itself. Mm -hmm. The problem I have with this episode is it was done so early in the storytelling of The Last of Us. We have literally had two episodes to get to know Joel and Ellie, and now suddenly we're doing a side quest episode that isn't about Joel and Ellie. I mean, it does tie in at the end, which is which is fine. Um, uh, but. But I, I felt like this is way too early. This is what you do when you're mm -hmm. like, you know, 10 episodes into the show. You do like a side quest episode, right? Where you you sort of take a step away from our lead characters and their journey. And I felt it was just too soon. This is this is episode 10, not episode three when we're so early. So that's that's kind of a problem that I had with it. Yeah, yeah. And well, I mean, let me address that for a second. The, the whole point yeah. of, of this episode is... Uh, Joel finally gets a car battery. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, it, I guess it ties in. This, that's the connection between this and the overall story. Joel needs a car battery. Joel needs a, a car battery, but it's but look, no, I, I um, I really, really enjoy this episode for this reason, um, because of the what it's about underneath the surface. Mm -hmm. This is about the despair and the heartache that would come with. An apocalypse, and also some of the 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 great parts about it. I mean, Bill initially, before he meets Frank, is happy. He's been prepping for the apocalypse forever, and it finally happens. He's <laughs> going to the hardware store. He's got his tractor. He's going and grabbing food. He's getting wine everywhere. This is what he was. Meant. This is all his life's work of being a survivalist now comes into play. Now comes his paid off. He's happy. It reminds me of. Uh, Dawn of the Dead, the original Dawn of the Dead by George Romero, where they're like in the mall and they have everything they could possibly want. I mean, they jokingly like break into a vault and in a safe filled with money, but it's worthless. The money is worthless. They have everything they could possibly want when it comes to shopping, but they're stuck in a mall. And what is the purpose in life? And so what Bill, I think, comes to realize, which is why his uh, relationship with Frank escalated so quickly is that there's there's more to life. Uh, there's more. Yeah. And, and that's kind of explained have, near the end. Yeah, absolutely. You need to have purpose, not just, and the purpose shouldn't be just to survive. The purpose is to connect and, and, and to have a purpose. And I think that's why being, that's why it's it's difficult well, to describe. Yeah. Well, let me, to, let me to live for someone else. I, I think yes. that's the ultimate purpose of humanity is, is to live beyond just your own selfish needs but to have to care for someone else. Right. But it's, it's, but it's also like the kind of purpose that comes with, and, and it's really difficult to explain and no disrespect to those of you who don't have children, but having kids at a young age changed my life, changed my life um, in, 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 in two ways. Uh, it just, one, I have a terrible memory. Uh, I used to have a photographic memory up until I had kids. And my understanding is for some people, like it's like your brain reprograms and it's almost like a hard drive that sequesters a certain part just for your kids. So since my kids, I had kids, my memory is not as good as it used to be. And secondly, also, it just gives you purpose. It gives you purpose in life, you know, um, because you have these people who, um, you know, you're responsible for. And you need to teach them as much as possible before you move on, before you pass on, so that they can survive without you. That's a huge responsibility. It changed everything about me. I feel like people who don't have children don't understand that. That's why when I see like uh, debates on social media and a lot of opinions coming from people that don't have children, I don't think you really have a right to have that opinion. And, and from from where I sit, you, you sit in my shoes and have kids and then maybe you can, I'm talking about people that probably we don't like, probably we would be in agreement. Mm -hmm. We don't like having opinions about how kids should be raised. 
I'll be doing that myself. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. But yeah, when, um, I think to your point, it's not that if you don't have children, you don't have right to opinion. But if you don't have children, you don't have the right to tell people who do how you should raise those children. That's exactly right. Um, we'll get to your comments in a moment, but mm. uh, but I, uh, I, I really enjoyed this episode. And the other thing is, it's even great because they this movie, this movie, this episode is not particularly political. It could have been, but what mm -hmm. I love about it is. Again, you've got a non-stereotypical person who happens to be gay. And for Bill, it's he's uh, what you would call a latent homosexual, right? Mm -hmm. Who comes out at an older age, realizes he's gay. That is a thing. And he um, he is he's having some trepidation about it, you know, comes to accept himself. And and so Bill's story uh, I, I think really plays out well and it's not all about them being gay. Right. And I would even argue that again, it's another example of probably someone who's more leaning conservative, uh, who's gay. It's not a stereotypical as Hollywood would normally, uh, Port yeah. portray I mean, it, pros, which is, I think is a terrible, as much as we know about Nick Offerman, offer Offerman, uh, I don't, I don't, wouldn't necessarily call him a woke progressive. Uh, in fact, uh, there are aspects of his life that I think wokeness would 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 attack him for, like like his love of meat, for one thing. His well, uh, I mean, yeah, like a Nick Offerman. I, I read his biography. Uh, what's it called? It's like Build Your Own Canoe. Yeah, that was it. Um, uh, the book is called Yeah, Pedal Your. It's called Pedal Your Own Canoe: One Man's Fundamentals for Delicious Living. And it's kind of the story of his life, but it's also like just his philosophy on things. He talks about watching Twin Peaks in college, which is great. It's such a great thing. Uh, yeah, but I read that book years ago. And uh, yeah, his character, he's not exactly like his character in Parks and Rec, but um, aspects of it. Yeah. And I, I would I would uh, recommend if uh, if you like, if you... Are a fan of meat and question veganism, uh, see the movie Sacred Cow, which he narrates. Yeah. So, you seen, yeah. You've seen that one, haven't you? What's that? The Sacred um, Cow? Oh, it, it, no, I it's, haven't. It's a, it's a meat documentary, basically. Oh, uh, I have not seen that. I have oh, not. that is a great documentary. And, and he is, uh, he's, I mean, his voice. Um, I think the other thing that uh, about this and, and getting back to the political, I, I wish kind of this episode existed in a political vacuum and therefore you could just enjoy it for the story itself. But we, there's so much political baggage we carry nowadays, especially when it comes to, to gay stories. But, you know, for forever, for the last 10 years, it's like, why are straight people playing gay characters and, and, and this resistance to do that. And, and that, and, and I feel like, by saying, oh, well, you know, this this resolves the argument that the straight people can play gay characters. It's like, you know, do we have any values? That, you know, I, I, I'm not saying they shouldn't or they should. I don't care. But there's the hypocrisy of it. The hypocr hypocrisy of complaining about certain people who do and certain people who don't. It's either all or nothing. You either let straight actors play gay characters. You either let gay characters play uh, gay actors play straight characters or you don't. You, you can't right. complain about it and have this vitriol for it when you allow it in some cases and not in others. It, you know, that this is my problem with the woke movement is there's no, there's no foundation in their rage. It's just, they feel angry at this. They feel angry at this, but it's, but that's okay. And this is okay. And, and there's just no way to judge the issue. And, and I say, forget it. This let people play characters that they want to play. Well, we're going to talk about this next week in more depth. Um, we don't have time today, but um, there's some articles that have come out. I want to go over and um, really what's happening is like wokeness is just eating itself. Yeah. Now it's like, you know, they're just attacking everyone internally. And um, Christian Toto, who writes about this a lot uh, is going to be on the podcast. It's going to be here in the next week or two talking about this. We're going to have him on the show because uh, I've always liked Christian Toto and his work. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we've got a lot of comments on this. So please, I appreciate your patience. We're going to get your comments. We have almost 600 people watching us live. If you are new to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. <laughs> oh, wow.
Yeah, because do you know why you should subscribe to the channel? Holy fucking shit, these reviews are delicious. Exactly, it's because our reviews are delicious. Comments starting from the top. Uh, Game Reward says, if it was normal, it wouldn't need to be normalized. Okay, mm -hmm. that's a fair point. Ninja kicked the damn rabbit. If Frank was a woman, it sounds like it would be creepy. Yeah, Actually, you know, yeah. That, 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 that seduction <laughs> scene, uh, this is the thing I thought. That, that seduction uh -huh. scene, if that was a woman... <laughs> We would be having a completely different conversation. Ex exactly. Uh, exactly. Game Reward also goes on to say they're hurting it by calling it all these things. Either just accept it or shut up about it. No one needs to grandstand for straight stories. Mm -hmm. Murdoch86, who's a member, thank you for that. The point of the story is for Joel to call Ellie baby girl. All the gay context is filler. Gamers know what I mean. Okay, well... Maybe I haven't gotten to that part yeah, of the you game. You gotta get there. You gotta you gotta get there tonight. All right, I will get there tonight. I'm gonna be playing for hours. Aaron Taylor, I saw multiple articles pro proclaiming it to be the greatest television yeah. episode ever made. Seriously, first of all, that's just the journalist, the kind of woke journalist, just like throwing that. Yeah. I, I know it. Whenever this is like, they love it. It's it's like, you know. It's, yeah. it's 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 like uh it's like a dog it's like a dog whistle it's like yeah. a, a a woke journalist dog whistle that's what this episode that is one. can we call it it's, that? A, it's an above average episode i'll, I'll grant it that but it's not it's the above average. it's above average but i think it's the best episode of this show so far wait did someone just say sparkle yeah Spark sorry I, i'm trying to start and i i activated it okay but Ken Bogus for two dollars sparkle sparkle <laughs> wait ask and you shall receive. Where is that? Where is that? Is it on them? Um, is this my adversaries crumble when we rumble? It's a catastrophe on anybody who's trying to hate coming blasting me. I've been in this for a minute. See how I graduated from rookie to beginner, but now I'm winning on the road. Backing up and selling our shows. But let's be on the tape of it and let them all know. Who, who heard Michael. Back to comments. I, I'm, I'm especially I, I inserted the music in that. I'm just especially proud that the music worked with the, with the actual dancing there. Jinx says hated the episode but loved Nick Offerman's performance. He is definitely going to get nominated for the Emmys and Golden Globe next year. Yeah, uh, yes, in a single episode, yes, yes, uh, hundred percent Jinx. Yeah. Uh, Denny Wright, does it forward the main story? Yes, uh, Joel has a battery. Joel has a battery. But see, here's what I like. I like the, we haven't seen since Dawn of the Dead, the like, you know, the initial being like so excited that the apocalypse has happened. Mm -hmm. And then there's this political, you know, and then it's like, okay, well, but there needs to be a larger purpose, you know, living. There needs to be like, hey, let's have a garden. Let's, you know, let's, there's just, I don't know. I just, I feel that they were, I, I liked this episode, but I shouldn't even, I'm saying that they did this episode too soon. I wanted to know yeah. more where Joel and Ellie are going. And I feel like they, they, I guess yeah. they needed the battery. And I'm just saying, I think they're hamstrung in the sense that Joel needed the battery. And I guess this is where it happens in the, in the game. And so it's kind of like, well, they, they have to tell the story at this time versus yeah. being able to wait till episode seven to do it. You know what? That could have been an easy thing to write differently. They need a battery later. Yeah, but then, later but then you're veering off the game, which is a whole other set of problems and criticism. Yeah, but there's even a great line where they're getting a discussion and they're talking uh, uh, briefly about politics. Bill and Frank are arguing, and and he and he says, you know, like, but the but the, you know, but the government are not nazis and he's like yeah they are nazis well i not back then i love it oh that was so good uh brock samson i actually the character on parks and rec was written to be like how he is as a person if you don't believe ask amy poehler oh that's awesome yes i read the um amy poehler biography autobiography yes please and i read nick's years ago uh Jeremiah Hembry for five says, what, what with the deal with back to the future Four? why is the film being made? Um, is there is, there is no back to the future Four. we did a set. We did two segments on our channel on back to the future. There are pitches oh, yeah. for back to the future Four that exist, but that movie will never happen. 
as long as Robert Zemeckis and Robert Gale are alive. And and but we have the greatest Back to the Future four pitch. Kenta. Yeah, so, so search our channel for Back to the Future, and you'll see it. It's not being made. It is merely an idea. So uh, thank you for that comment. Uh, Salad ass says bacon. Well, absolutely. Great point, Alan, says Jinx. Brock yep. Samsonite yep. says, if you don't have kids, your perspective on life is just different, plain and simple. Absolutely. That's why I think there's so much disagreement on social media about certain issues because it literally comes down to I'm raising children. I don't have children, but here's how I think you should raise your children. I'm sorry, you lost me. You have lost me. And Arturo Pardo says, those meddling kids got away with my memory. And <laughs> Offerman is a Renaissance man, says Goober. There is a video. Okay. There's a video. I think Adult Swim did this video with Nick Offerman. It's a uh, it's a Christmas video. And I had it on a loop on a Christmas party I had at my place years ago. And it's literally Nick Offerman sitting in front of a fire with uh, with it's Basically, he's got an old fashioned and he's sitting there for like 45 minutes looking at you. And it's just Nick Offerman looking at you with an old fashioned. He doesn't say any words. He's just sitting, looking at you. He changes his position in the chair. He takes a drink of the old fashioned. The fire is sort of crackling next to him. And it goes on for 45 minutes. So I made a playlist where like it's just Nick Offerman on a loop on the TV looking at you. It is great. Look for that video. Nick, look up Nick Offerman on YouTube fireplace. You will find the video. Um, SWD 40 says, I think the zombie kiss from episode two was a fake out. I feel like the producers were like, if you thought that was off putting, wait until the next episode, you bigots. Mm -hmm. But I think you kind of have to like, I actually don't think that I, I feel like, I feel like the company that does that more is probably Disney. It kind of really feels like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and but it doesn't I, look like they're gonna stop either. I, I, I don't see it. Um, I don't see it. Paulie's in the chat saying, What did I miss, homies? We're talking about Last of Us episode three, which you did not like Patan, which I completely disagree. It's a Michael Bay movie, Paulie. Paulie from Latino Slant. Shout out to him. Subscribe to the channel. MK Solid 82 says Alan must say, very good, Chris, but bricks don't hit back. <laughs> there you go. CD <laughs> CD There's some Stein. context there that I'm missing. <laughs> CD Stein 69 says the episode story was almost completely different than the one in the game. Okay, I haven't played the one in the game yet. Yeah, so someone else brought that up as well. Other um, people have brought it up. So much better in the game. Also, this felt like more like a filler episode than any integral part of the story. Um, thank you for that comment. Yeah. I know will... Joel, Joel got his car battery. He got his battery. It's a quest. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got to get to some, we, wait, can you hear that, that car alarm in the background? No, Today has just been a nightmare. Car <laughs> alarm, the stuff happening. Okay, good. You can't hear it. Tom Siebert says without, without a doubt, having children changed my sense of purpose from self-directed to outwardly directed. Mm -hmm. Tom, I feel you. That is exactly how I felt. I mean, I actually did when my daughter was born. I, I was the first person to hold her in my arms covered in, you know, it looks like the scene from the first alien uh, with Kane at the breakfast table. Um, but um, held her in my arms and I was a changed mm -hmm. man. Latino slant says Patan was lame. Disagree. And you know what? <laughs> We're free to disagree. We are yeah, I mean, it's no RRR. And, and it's, it's, not, it's not RRR. It's I'm, not, that standard. I'm not trying to say it's RRR. I'm saying it's a dumb Michael Bay movie way over the top mm -hmm. with way over sexualized characters and you don't get to see them very often. So I, I disagree, Paul. And James Bond didn't have his shirt off uh, as often as, as our heroes here. Amanda Nowicki says, spoiler for the video game. Bill is a stone cold killer. He kills anyone who comes close to his home, except when Frank comes along. Yep. Interesting. Spidey Sensei yeah. 72. The Walking Dead did all this for years. Seeing it again on The Last of Us would have been redundant. This was just good storytelling. Um, 
Chris, you're right about filler episodes. So early on, this does not serve the plot. Moving forward, for, forward says Rita Ibn Muhammad. Amanda Nowicki, Bill and Frank would have been better characters in the TV show if the sanctuary was invaded by zombies and the two have to follow Joel an episode uh, for an episode or two. Yeah. Um, yeah totally agree I, with I, you. Let me, let me just say, for the first two episodes of The Last of Us, what was Joel trying to do? He was trying to get that damn car battery. <laughs> uh, so finally, finally, in episode three, he got the battery. All I right. Mean, I, I hear you, Alan. People. Come on, people. It's He got the battery. Resolution. You know, they set up a situation. Joel needs a car battery. He JT... got the car battery. <laughs> JTPRX is a member. Says, totally agree with you, Alan. Filler episode. I heard the Bill and Ellie have interaction, and we will not see it. Because no Bill is dead. You gotta watch the episode. I, I think I think it, yeah. it's um good storytelling. I think it's good storytelling, but it's an episode so early, I think was a mistake. Brock Samson, it's more about the side characters and their story than the main storyline, and that's a bit unnecessarily distracting. Thomas Dark Pickett memories. for five. The woke crowd wants another black mirror mirror San Junipero. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> they want that. They really want that. Uh Am thank you for that. Amanda yeah, the Wiki uh, in the show. Bill and Frank are under zero threats. Everything is perfect. Gay people are not allowed to have hard lives on TV anymore. Um, uh, Swords and Starships, which is a newly launched YouTube channel that you should check out. I get your take, Alan. I don't think it was woke, but yes, all the people hyping it is yeah. so cringe. It's they're just looking for, this is the thing. I feel like we're over, we're, we may be, as a group of viewers, overreacting to things, uh, to, to wokeness. It's ask yourself if you may be overreacting to it. And then the thing is, is that the journalists that like to hype this stuff, they're then, um, they're way over promoting it and over praising it. So you've got these two things. I think that there's, there's a happy medium. This is a, uh, this is a very good episode of the show that, is probably going to get nominated for Emmys, mm -hmm. but it, it occurs too late, too early in the story. It occurs too early in the story. Um, Super chats. Wait, uh, Jinx says portrait of a lady on fire is the greatest gay love story ever told. Not the last of us. Episode three. I would agree. I would agree. Aaron Taylor. I saw multiple articles proclaiming it to be the greatest television episode ever. Seriously? Yeah, I think I might have read that one. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's, it's just this hard press uh, for it that All right. I don't understand. And Last few super chats, and then unfortunately we have to pivot. Well, not unfortunately. I love to pivot. We try to cover a lot on this show. Um, Greg C for five says the last of us episode three was a moral story for Joel about protecting the ones you love the heart of Joel and mm -hmm. Ellie's relationship in the future. Yeah. I just, I just, yeah. I, I'm sort of getting annoyed with Ellie, her like, you know, insistence on exploring and like, I can take care of it myself. I don't need you to help me. It just, this is going to get tired. Their relationship has to evolve because it's getting already getting just a little tired because it's so one note pilgrim media says i feel hollywood has pedro pascal bloat they literally hire him for everything he's hosting by the way pedro pascal hosting snl this weekend <laughs> hosting snl this weekend uh which is an unwatchable show by the way have you tried to watch? I'll occasionally catch the yeah. clips on youtube just to remind myself oh yes it's still terrible so bad. Um, Wayward Noodle for five says, we're starving for entertainment. Eddie Murphy compared a girl making you wait for intimacy to a starving man getting a cracker. Damn, was that a Ritz? <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's a Ritz, all right. But, uh, well, look, bottom line is, bottom line on this is I'm still interested in in watching the last of us and i will continue to watch it are there, i believe there are nine episodes so we're yes. maybe third of the way through the season i'll verify but i'm pretty sure it's nine i think third of the way through the season and um i'm enjoying it and it's keeping me interested well, and it, it also makes sure i i, I love i love zombie films and apocalypse uh apocalyptic stuff 
And, and this really has me. I also love the prepper stuff in this was so good. Like, I'm just like, oh my God, it's great. He put up the gate and electrified it. Just like all, he's got the gas, like just all those things. It's like, if you've ever read um, the Max Brooks, uh, the, the well, well, World War Z, uh, but Max Brooks. Uh, I think it's Zombie Survival Guide. Zombie yeah. Survival Guide. I read the Zombie Survival Guide by Max Brooks. You need to get that book. What I love is, is, you know, one of his first pieces of advice is when the apocalypse happens, fill up your bathtub. Why am I filling my bathtub? Because all city services, you're going to lose power and you're going to lose all your water. Fill up your bathtub, fill up as many containers with water as you possibly can. You know, uh, ideally build a moat around your place. Like among it's, it's the coolest. It's not even about zombies. It's like a prepper's guide. Um, uh, Max Brooks, the the zombie survival guide. Although Max Brooks, I'll say, as a guest on the Bill Maher show, is kind of I'm not a fan. He's just super, super one sided politically, and I mm -hmm. kind of find him. It, it's a little off putting. Yeah. He's a little off putting, but I love his books. And World War Z is great. A much better than that terrible movie with Brad Pitt. I thought it was awful. All right, it's time to pivot, Alan. It's time to pivot. It's time. It's look, it's time to pivot. <laughs> pivot, 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 pivot. It's time to talk about 80 for Brady. Yeah. All right. Yeah, now finally. We have like 630 people watching. It's going to drop in half. As <laughs> yeah. We talk about so before we start, hit that subscribe button, hit that like yes, button. Yes. Before and then you, you can leave, leave and not talk about it. Before you leave. we talk about 80 for Brady. The over 600 people watching. Before you leave, because you don't care about one. this movie, but you might want to stick around. Smash that like button. Subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed. Well, we Please lost three more. We lost. Yeah, we're just losing. Don't go. <laughs> don't go. 80 for Brady. Let, let's talk about it. First, I have to show you By the something. way, David Dasmalchin is coming uh, David Desmolchin will be here in like 15 minutes. David Desmolchin is going to be here. So please stick with us. But I have to show you this, Alan. Look what look what I picked up. Look what I picked up. I got this. I have to, I have to go full screen for a second and show you. It's the latest issue of <laughs> AARP magazine, Sex in Your 50s. And it has the cast of 80 for Brady right there on the cover on AARP magazine. Wow. So that, that, that begs the question, what's it like being a member of AARP? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I wouldn't know. I'm not there yet, but I, <laughs> I, I don't know. I picked up this magazine when I saw it. Uh, but they, let's, um, a, 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 AARP, 80 for Brady, uh, uh, if you don't know, is the trailer that you've been watching in theaters that you're like, oh, I'm going to go get popcorn. Um, I've been watching this trailer for months. It It, it is cringe inducing the trailer. It looks terrible, and I'm not going to try to convince you that this is a good movie. I'm not, and I'm not even going to say that it's not a terrible movie, but it is a highly entertaining movie. It is what I would call a movie in the genre of cute old people. What are cute old people movies? Uh, that one where Robert De Niro goes to Vegas. Uh, I forget the name of that one. Uh, the Cocoon yeah. movies. The Cocoon movies are all about cute old people. It's cute old people in the twilight of the years going on a last hurrah. And this movie is based on a true story of four women in their 80s. Well, one happens to be 75. Played by Lily Tomlin, Jane Fonda, Rita Moreno, and Sally Field. Collectively, how many Oscar nominations and Oscar wins do those actors have? Uh, like, uh, impeccable, in great talented actors in a broad comedy for mainstream audience and they want to go to the Super Bowl. Why? Because they're huge fans of Tom Brady in particular and uh, not necessarily New England Patriots, but Tom Brady. They're huge fans of Tom Brady. They became a fan of Tom Brady when he stepped up when Drew Bledsoe, and I remember this game, Drew Bledsoe got injured on the New England Patriots. Tom Brady was the backup and became the quarterback and then won. And it was the year that 9-11 happened. And uh, the country was much more united back then 
uh, post 9-11, country was much more united, much more patriotic, much more nationalistic, uh, which has unfortunately become a dirty word. But the Patriots, the New England Patriots under Tom Brady won that year, the year after 9-11. Um, and uh, it's a great story. And this focuses on the game, probably the greatest Super Bowl game ever played, which was the, the New England Patriots uh, battling the Atlanta Falcons, where they were down, I think it was at halftime, 27 to three. And they came back and came, Tom Brady came, led the team to come back and win. It is one of the greatest Super Bowls ever played. Um, it's not a spoiler. That happened years ago. This is based on that. This is when these women went to the Super Bowl. They're all dealing with different problems. Sally Field's character has kind of an overbearing husband. Um, Lily Tomlin's character, she may or may not um, have been diagnosed with cancer. Jane Fonda writes Gronk fanfic, and um, she's she's um, kind of rediscovering herself. Uh, and uh, her rom and her romantic interests in men. She ends up like uh, meeting Harry Hamlin, and uh, they hit it off very well. Rita Moreno has uh, a man uh, a man who's has a crush on her at the facility that she is she is living at. They all have their different problems, uh, but they but they want to go to the Super Bowl. They run into challenges. Um, you see a lot of it in the trailer. Look. I'm not here to tell you this is a good movie. I'm here to tell you whether you are a Tom Brady fan or not. And I'm an NFL fan, okay? My team is the Detroit Lions, but they've never even been to the Super Bowl. The last time the Lions won, they won the world championship as it was known in the 1950s. They've never been even been to the Super Bowl. So I kind of have to like, I come up with teams. I like this team. I'll root for that team. And uh, so, so uh, just the enthusiasm being a fan of football, I love this game. It's really part of, partly this game is like a celebration of being a fan of something and how that can bring people together, it, 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 how it can forge friendships. And, and that's what the film is about. That's what it explores. A lot of the comedy is dumb. They go to this party and Rita Moreno like takes too many, like, you know, uh, Gummy, gummy and she gets high guy fieri plays himself in the film uh other characters play themselves so to speak tom uh, brady for crying out loud tom brady plays himself tom brady's a character in the movie it's this movie is produced by tom brady starring tom brady who plays tom brady and it's but it's this is a light comedy and i would compare it to other types of comedies with really, really talented actors who are Oscar winning or Oscar nominated actors with a lot of gravitas, but they'll go off and do like a, a, a light broad comedy. Like I would compare it to, do you remember like these movies that Clint Eastwood used to make like any which way you can every which way, but loose, mm -hmm. or it's like, it's a monkey movie where it's Clint Eastwood and an orangutan and he plays a trucker. You know, Hollywood used to make movies about people that were blue collar workers they used to make movies about those people. They don't make those movies about people like that anymore. But that's what I also related to in this film is that this movie is just about regular, normal people. There's no agenda in this or anything. But it's also like these older women kind of experiencing like, oh, this is what it's like to be at the, the Super Bowl. It's very fish out of water. Um, and Sally Field is in particular good. Um, in this film, she's really good in a movie that I recommend. Oh, by the way, we've lost like 60 people. <laughs> yeah. Started reviewing this film. Stick with us. You can engage in the conversation, yeah. folks. David Desmalchin is going to be here. David Desmalchin will be here any minute, ready for your questions and comments. Make sure to ask questions for David. Um, he was Polka Dot Man in the Suicide Squad. Anyway, <laughs> um, you'll know who he is when you see him. Um, but 80 for Brady is just it's just stupid fun. Alan, I, I had a good time. People cheered at the end. I can't think of the last time I was at a movie where people like applauded like multiple times during the film. It was a packed audience, multiple times broke out in applause, cheered. There's this line at the near the end of the movie. Tom Brady gives a line. The audience goes freaking nuts. When was the last time an audience went nuts at the movies? I'll tell you when it was. It was RRR. But I'm not trying to tell you this is a good movie. But you it's just made an RRR comparison and, to Andy from And Brady. a shout out to Ryan Cannell, who has gone to see Tom Brady multiple times play games. 
if he doesn't see this film, 80 for Brady, is Ryan Cannell from RK Outpost, is Ryan Cannell truly a Tom Brady fan if he doesn't go to a movie that's that stars Tom Brady? I ask you, Ryan, go see 80 for Brady, and I want to get your thoughts on it. Uh, Alan, what did you think of 80 for Brady? Yeah, uh, you're overselling it a bit. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. <clears throat> Let's be real. This movie should have been a lot worse than it was. Right. Uh, I I was okay with it. I you were in a packed audience. I was in an audience for one. And, no, you're uh, kidding. It was oh, it was just me and and my my local Regal Theater, which was about to be closed because of bankruptcy, is now open again. Uh -huh. uh, uh, so I can now again see movies by myself at this theater. Um, yeah, I, I didn't have anything fundamentally bad to say about it. It's, you know, having seen all four of these actresses at the height of their careers and to now see them in 80 for Brady, um, you know, there, there's there's a little bit of sadness I have for that. Um, I mean, I hate to harp on it, but uh, Jane Fonda's work on her face is... Um, it's it's a, I think they've all had work and it's all a little distracting. No, but they, maybe Lily Tomlin a little bit, but it is so noticeable. I mean, just look at the picture here. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and and we saw her at the Critics Choice Award, and she, you know, it's it's like, I mean, I feel bad because I, I feel like natural appearances are much more attractive than than what you know than this Botox and the super stretches. Okay, so I'll move on beyond that. Um, yeah, it's okay. You know, if if this if anything about what is said about this movie has interest, go and see it. But I would definitely not um, well recommend. Uh, yeah, it, really, let me let me just say my favorite sure. part about the movie is I forgot this is Super Bowl Fifty One, um, where they are playing against the Falcons, and I forgot how incredible that game was until yeah, uh, I mean, yeah that, they, they bring back the emotion of that game in this movie, and if you want to, you know, they they bring out this comeback story. Um, and that is probably the best thing about this movie. And and quite frankly, the, there's a connection between Tom Brady and the Lily Tomlin character that that somehow worked. Uh, you know, maybe maybe I'm so desperate for something good in this movie, but you know, there's a part where where you know we we find out how Tom Brady was able to pull it together uh, before the fourth quarter and and turn the game around. And well, don't give it do, away; it's a spoiler. Yeah. But 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 it's it's that interaction between him and Lily Tomlin at that time and after they won the Super Bowl that was really the heart. If if there was a heart and emotion of this show of this movie, that was it. But again, um, you know, I think we're risking overselling this movie. Well, um, here's what I want to say about it. It's just it stands <coughs> out in, in a sea of things that are dystopian that are apocalyptic that yeah. are depressing that are dark this is a light fun movie and yes i am overselling it i cannot tell you that it was a good movie so i, I can't tell you it's a good movie it is a fun movie and it's light comedy and and you'll you you will more than likely have a good time but you and that's yeah. it. Uh, I mean, we have some comments we got to get through here before. Yeah, I'll just say the humor is not as cringe worthy as you think of it. The movie is basically a series of scenelets and gags along the way, and and I will say this: uh, I have had a crush on Sally Field since since uh, I was ten, and I think I still hold on to that crush today. I, is, yeah, I I love she Sally. Is absolutely gorgeous in this movie in in a very girls next door kind of way. She is like a girl next door. I also love Sally Field. Uh, quick recommendation. See a movie called My Hello, My Name is Doris. Yeah. Hello, My Name is Doris stars Sally Field as a woman who's lost her mother. Yeah, uh, I think Amazon works, Prime has that one. Amazon Prime has it so you can see it. And she ends up having a crush on a man who's much too young for her and how awkward that interaction goes. And it's a very good film. Uh, quick Quick comment, uh, comments and questions here before we get to David Desmulchin. Thomas Pickett for five says, who is this movie for? I was in the theater with my mom and sister watching the trailer and couldn't say anything. It's 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 a family movie. It's a family movie. Yeah, it's, says, it's, if you are a fan of Tom Brady. Yeah. Uh, Chucksy says, I, really I read the zombie survival guide years ago, but in all honesty, I'll be dead pretty quick when the apocalypse hits anyways. Uh, so there's not much point to it. Gilf Manor show incoming. Just kidding, says Jocelyn. <laughs> Latino Slant says, Rita, the only EGOT 
just saying latino slant slant says maybe i'll take mom yeah by the way there is there is one other egot but it's not an actor there you go thomas pickett for five says the only blue collar movies that hollywood makes are a blue collar worker loses his job and needs to become a boxer to earn his love of his daughter denny wright says is lily tom so lily tom oh, you, the game. Spoiled the, you just spoiled no the that's game. not true don't spoil, spoil it alan wink yeah wink, the patriots win, win. <laughs> and cd stein 69 our last comment says let's just call it what it is golden girls go to a football game i'm okay with that would probably watch if they made a new show out of them by the way as a former st louis rams fan f tom brady and the pat and the pat <laughs> you are you are fine to feel that way we By the way, very, they, they do make uh, a couple of Golden Girls jokes. In the, they in the do way. make Golden Girls jokes. That's right. But we have a very special guest that's joining us momentarily on the show. Uh, I've got a quick. I want to. I want to get our. Do a different background here. Um, we have the illustrious. Um, you know this. You know this actor. He is an actor in some of your favorite movies, David Desmalchin. You probably noticed him in The Dark Knight in an incredible, it's a, in a small role, but incredibly memorable. Everybody remembers that scene from The Dark Knight uh, with Batman and Harvey Dent's interaction with one of the Joker's, Joker's henchmen. And, and that scene just, it really stood out. It really stood out. Also, he's in The Suicide Squad as Polka Dot Man. He's an Ant-Man. He plays a character named Kurt. He was Piter DeVries in Dune. Also in the upcoming uh, Oppenheimer. And I, last night at the theater, I saw a new trailer. David David is in. He's in a movie called The Boogeyman, which is a Stephen King film. And he has the Count Crowley comic book that's coming out. Actor David Desmalchin is joining us on the show. Here we go, David. Thank you for... Oh, David, wow. you're here, dude. Happening, dude. buddy. Dude, what is going on? Oh, I like the new hair. I like the new hair. Look, man, how are you? Doing great, dude. You, this is the thing. You are legit. Look at this background here. Look at all of the. You've got a rack. You have a full rack in your place. And look, fear is the mind killer. Look at this amazing. Oh my God, your setup. I'm I'm envious. Famous monsters. That's how you know. Look oh, at wow. look at that shelf. Look at all this cool stuff. Oh my God, David! Um, I'm living the I, dream, as are you, my friend. Living the dream. Well, not just that. Another thing. I mean, I don't even know what to, where to start to talk to you. That you have so many projects coming out. Uh, Oppenheimer, your second time you're working with Christopher Nolan. That says a lot. You've got a book coming out. I, you're doing a book signing. I believe it's next Wednesday. Yeah. Anybody who's in LA. Please come and join us. Um, we've got the new trade paperback for Count Crowley, uh, Amateur Midnight Monster Hunter. And this is volume two. And the book is so beautiful. I just got uh, to take a look at a copy uh, before it goes to, to shops next Wednesday. And dude, I'm so excited. So yeah, if you're in LA, definitely come to uh, Revenge of, which is such a cool shop. I don't know. Have you ever stopped in there? Have I haven't. There? I'm, dude. Yeah, I haven't. I mean, there's so many good shops in the world I, it's one of my favorite things to do. it's like some people go to a new city and they go right to the first favorite michelin re restaurant or their favorite uh burger or their favorite museum i'm immediately like where is the comic shop and then <laughs> like revenge of is one of those that i would walk into and be like who is the mastermind mad scientist behind this place because it feels like it's like an old school bodega the design is like a bodega so the comics are lined up in like the refrigerator section in a weird way they have a whole pinball uh room which i love old vintage video games and stuff so yeah come through come say hi where, where i'd love to it, uh love to see you hey no, what's I, up man how are you Good. Hey, this Good is Alan Ng. Yeah. Alan hey, Ng. Alan. How's it yeah. going, man? I think we passed each other at the Elvis party. But uh, yes, we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good to see you. But, but where is Revenge of? Uh, what, what it's in Eagle way? Rock. Um, and the exact address I will have by the end of this okay. interview. All right. Well, Eagle <laughs> Rock is probably good enough. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Revenge of it's it's a rad rad shop, and uh, and yeah, I'm gonna be there signing. Uh, if if you're a, an autograph hound and you want, please. Uh, you know, come get one of my trades and then bring, I don't know, you got a picture of Polka Dot Man you want me to sign? Bring it. Uh, <laughs> you've got a, uh, you know, you want me to sign your foot? Bring it. I'll do it. 
<laughs> well, David, I've been such a, you've been on the uh, Film Threat podcast. Uh, yes, a we've had times. some really good conversations over the years, man. We've we've gotten to know each other really well. So it's a really cool moment to be reconnecting with a huge week. The next, like the next six weeks of my life are pretty banana Graham. So it's pretty awesome to get to reconnect. And we, and I saw you at the Elvis party, which was such a good way to reconnect. I never, um, I never met Austin Butler before any, he, he was walking by and he goes, I didn't want to bug him. It's his party, even though, you know, it's like, it's it gotta be a weird thing when you're a, a star of a movie and you're at a party to celebrate your movie and 95% of the guests at the party have, you have no clue who they are, <laughs> like why they're there. And he's just like, trying to be polite to everybody. And, and it was really rad because he saw me and he stopped and he's like, Hey, what's up? Uh, <laughs> you know, they've just finished filming the new, uh, the new Dune. And, um, and so we got to talk about uh, Dune and he recognized me from, um, from Dune, uh, even though I don't really look like I did in Dune normally. This, this is a wig. Normally I actually do look like Piter. <laughs> I, I slapped this on right before the interview started. Uh, but it's but uh, you you play Piter DeVries, uh, yes. which was uh, played by uh, Brad Dorif in the original. Think Dune. about those Dune shoes Lynch. to fill, Chris. Those yeah. are shoes, man. That guy. What talk about a huge inspiration for me? He always has been. I think that his you know relationship, his way of his work with you know from David Lynch all the way to Peter Jackson and a billion roles in between he's like one of those consummate you know disappear into the role kind of character actors that doesn't fear the darker corners of 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 cinema and it's it's a place that I've liked to skitter around as I consider myself kind of a spider on the floor of Hollywood you know I'm just kind of sneaking around in the cracks and shadows and playing the weirder creepier little beasts and uh and Brad, like that when I when when Denny told me he wanted me to play Piter, I, I was like, oh man, that's big shoes to fill. But luckily we we had a whole interesting and unique take on Piter and the Mentats and that whole universe that I love that really connected to that's one of my favorite books. So I I love that film. I'm so lucky I was I was a part of it, man. Crazy. Well, not just that. Well, first of all, there's over 500 people watching us live on YouTube. We have so many questions and comments. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Ask me your toughest question. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll get to it in just a second, but I have to make a, a, a let people know a quick thing. You are one of those rare actors that, I mean, you're always working, always just so like in, in character-driven roles, constantly working, but it's also not just that. You're one of those rare actors that understands the craft. You understand film. And on that, there was an announcement. Was it this week? I'm looking at it. You are starting a genre a production company, genre focused uh, film production company, making indie movies, character driven projects across horror, sci fi, and fantasy for film, television, audio, and publishing called Good Fiend Films. This was just announced on um, Deadline, actually. Was it this week? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm going to bring that up. But uh, how cool is that? Like, like it's, that it's, is that is awesome. <sighs> It's so awesome, man. I feel like I've got um, my own star base now and uh, I've been, you know, putting this together for years and the dream ever since we went to make animals back in 2013, 2013, I thought I really want to create a company in a space where I can shepherd the kind of projects that I want to see make their way, you know, from page to, to screen and, um, and you know, I I've talked really openly. I'm somebody who is uh, has worked through and continues to work through the process of of recovery. I think mental wellness and a lot of the issues around being a human being that make being a human being so difficult, which is one of the things I think that unites a lot of us who are into uh, geekdom, is like not only do we get the opportunity to escape in the marvelous fantasy that's created by, you know, you know, incredible comic book and movie and TV shows. But also I think there's something about the themes of, of people, you know, overcoming huge amounts of adversity and, and figuring out what it is that's wrong or broken with themselves and how to change that and how to shift that and how to turn that into something that is uh, powerful, how to something that can help them survive. And, and I think that, um, you know, the lens of horror and uh, science fiction and, and superhero storytelling is something that gets often maligned by 
people in maybe the more highbrow corners of publishing and cinema. And fortunately for us, everybody watching this podcast right now, we're living in a moment when it's not just this tongue in cheek, uh, wink, wink, silly, campy thing. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with a fun, awesome, campy horror movie, superhero movie. Don't get me wrong. They need to happen. But there's also a space for stories that really um, wrestle with the bigger, tougher questions. And I think uh, character driven plots, stories that dive further than just capes and spandex are really important. And um, and I want to help bring them to life. And I've got a really rad slate of projects. Hopefully you and I will be meeting many times over the next years to come to talk about our uh, Good Fiend releases. The first thing that my company is a part of was um, a film called Late Night with the Devil, which I also star in, which is set in the 1970s. It's going to premiere in just a few weeks. I'm so excited. I oh, hope wow. you can be there in Austin at South by Southwest. Uh, any, are Alan you going? We're going. We're going. You're going. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll go. We'll be there. We'll be there. All right. Let's let's also. Are you doing a? Are you doing the podcast? Or are you going to do any live? We're going to do live stuff. Room. We're going to do live stuff from South by Soul. See you there. Okay. Hit up Jordan, man. We got to do something together. Okay. Cool. We'll do it. Okay. We'll do it. And I'm going to do an event at a comic shop in Austin too. Uh, but anyway, cool. yeah. Late night with the devil. I'm so excited for you to see this movie, dude. It's like getting to play a guy. It's like network meets the exorcist meets. I don't know. I, and it's such, it was such a challenging role for me because you're stepping into the shoes of this guy who was a late night talk show host, which is something I would never imagine myself getting to play. Like, you know, imagine the equivalent of a Dick Cavett or David Letterman, but like mm -hmm. doing that. And then, and then he was, so far behind Carson in the ratings and it was driving him so crazy that he ended up um, doing pushing things in a way one night trying to get <laughs> trying to trying to get uh, to save his show his career and his mind and and it's cool because the whole film basically takes place over the course of one broadcast um, but yeah that's that's gonna be a film I think that is gonna rock people's minds and uh, I'm so proud that it's like the first project that'll have the good fiend banner attached to it. And then we go into production on another film in the spring. And I've got um, almost three comic books now that are being going into production that are um, on pipelines for development into film and television. And uh, yeah, man, good fiend. It's time for all of us. Good fiends to <laughs> unite and stick together. And we got to fight for the good monsters and we got to take down the bad monsters. Well, here we go. You're getting so many comments and questions here. So there's, we got like, they're just, they're coming in fast and furious. So let me get to as many as I can. And the one thing uniquely, someone was saying, isn't he in DC? It's like, yeah, polka dot man. But I can see you, someone said you should be the next Joker in the new DC universe that James Gunn is putting together. So I, I, I fully expect James Gunn to get you to play someone, a different new character in DC. So... Whoever said that, that's uh, your lips to God's ears, my friend. That was, uh, that's the kind of compliment an actor can live with All right. or die with. Uh, that's the kind of thing you want on your tombstone. That was, that was very lovely of you to say, you know, if there's a space for me in the future of the world that James is creating, I'll be grateful. The reality is I already did get to play. I think one of the coolest characters James has brought to the screen. I think that even though Abner aka polka dot man is such an abused maligned picked on uh outcast by the end of that film i was so proud of the fact that we brought him to a place and that james created this this arc for him where he was cool like he really was pretty pretty cool and uh and I remember you and I connecting after you saw the film and you were mm -hmm. so supportive of that, man. It meant so much to me. It was so nice when you uh, hit me up. That was, that was really <laughs> rad. I really, I'm really proud of that film. And I've been so lucky. You guys know that, like, look at my life, you know, I'm a, you know, this is yeah. the stuff that I live for, but there, that doesn't, it doesn't discount the fact that every day I don't wake up and just go, I don't know. I've been so lucky, man. I can't believe I get, I get to play in these playgrounds and, um, and you guys know like what's happening in just a few days. We haven't even yeah. talked about what's oh, about oh, to happen. And, and that, well, you're going to the premiere. I believe it's Monday, right? Are you going to be there? Uh, I no, no, I don't get yeah, we'll be at a screening. Though. Yeah. We'll be at a screening. We'll get to see it early. Okay. Have did you see yesterday's trailer drop? Did you get a peek of my character? No, no. 
No, oh, yeah. Wait. They they gave you a little glimpse of uh, Veb yesterday oh. on the uh, new the TV spot that dropped yesterday. It's on YouTube somewhere. Uh, it was a brand it. new That's TV great. spot that dropped. Although someone who posted on YouTube said, called the character Zeb. So it was funny because I was getting messages from people all day saying like, we see Zeb. And I was like, who's Zeb? Oh, <laughs> it, it's Veb. Um <laughs> Oh, oh, you guys. Oh, you guys. Oh, you guys. Okay. So Peyton, you're probably talking Peyton. Oppenheimer or are you talking Ant-Man? Ant-Man. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They just dropped a, t- a TV spot for Ant-Man yesterday that uh, you get a glimpse of my character. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, it's not this, it's not the same character I've yeah. played before. You know that? Oh, you're kidding. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought it, it's a, I thought it was the same. Am character. I, am I, am I? Oh, this oh, might, might be, be breaking spoiler. something. This might be spoiler. <laughs> if, you're, if you're in the trailer, yeah, okay. then it's spoiled. So, but but this is your third time working with Peyton Reed. <laughs> Am I about to get a phone call? Call? I'm Disney? glad you're in the new. Oh no, that, Peyton Reed is calling you right now. Um, no, let's get Peyton, to the you guys. Peyton, huh. the movie that he made, it's insane. I haven't even seen the whole thing yet. I've seen what I get to see when I go to the ADR stage. I was just at the ADR stages before the holidays, like looking at these giant screens and him it's insane. It is. I don't even know how to describe it. I've never, it's the Marvel's never done anything like this yet. And it's um, yeah. And I'm super excited about who I get, who I, who I get to bring to life. Um, So, yeah. Well, you got to tell James Gunn, look, Peyton just had me play a different character. You can play a different character in the DC universe. Look there. I think there's so many characters and I know James likes to work with, you know, the same people a lot. So I predict 100% you're going to play something, someone different in uh, the new DC universe. Let's get to comments because there are so many. (laughs) Thank you, Football Frequency. I see you and I heart you. Thank you, Football (laughs) Frequency. I really appreciate that. Yes, you guys, look at this. Look at this art. I mean, get out of here. Lucas is a genius, you guys. That's right. And if, you know... If there's any any of my um you know readers out there, comic book lovers out there who are looking for a badass woman that doesn't have to show off her midriff or her you know tatas to be looking cool on the cover of a comic book, you got to get into Jerry Bartman. She is a flawed, badass, sloppy, right hook swing in. There's no uh, mini skirts on this chick, man. It's Doc Martens and busted up jeans, and she's gonna kill so many monsters i'm so excited uh let's see the joker says i am thoroughly enjoying desmulchin's work i cast him to play noel fielding for the making of the mighty boosh you know what joker i love noel fielding so much and mighty boosh is so great and i always think of oh greg and i liked i think i could play the moon i'd be good the moon i am the moon the moon (laughs) is watching chris score yeah i'd be good on that show you're right you tell them Shelby Love says David was so great with his cameo and oh. weird. Alan and I both love that film. Uh, I do too, weird man. That was a good. that was one of those gifts that fell in my lap. I've been friends with Al for a long time, thanks to Paul Rudd, because Paul hosts the Big Slick uh, uh, charity um, in Kansas City, and Al has been a guest for many years. And so I've gotten to know Weird Al. I've been a fan of Weird Al since I was a kid. And um, yeah, he just t- he texted me out of the blue one day and said, "Do you want to come play John Deacon in my movie?" And I said. Who's John? <laughs> and then I think he said exactly. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Gabriel Quiroga for five says, wow, cool to see you, David. Love your range of characters from Dune, Blade Runner, Dark Knight, etc. Which role character would you play if you can pick a movie? Hmm. I I have always, you know, said in 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 my my dream, um, I'd love to. I'd really, I'd, I'd love to work with the Muppets in, in like a feature film setting, uh, where I play maybe like a, either a Vincent Price type of villain, uh, uh, against them, or even maybe an ally. Um, and lifelong dreams include, um, you know, I think, I think being a James Bond villain is something that, uh, that I'll work towards every day. Um, and I, I have a couple of of character specific roles that I would name, but I'm too super sp- superstitious to tell you. But uh, I think you would dig them. Uh, I'll tell you this: I did always dream of, and I I worked out really hard for a couple of years. 
and it was for nothing other than my wife's satisfaction. Um, <laughs> it was for nothing. Uh, I wanted so badly to get to bring uh, Morbius is one of my favorite comic books mm. of all time. And when I heard that there was the chance that they were going to be developing that into something, I, I really, I've just, I've lived with that character. My, my, since I was 12, I've like, I've, I've just been obsessed with him. Um, but alas, that's the life of an actor, you know? Okay. Uh, more questions. Pineapple on pizza. Yay or nay says Sokoto doesn't know. It's an important one. It is an important one. It's an interesting question. It, you know, what's interesting. Um, Sokoto, the, the thing with pineapple on pizzas depends on the pizza. Like it really does. Like there's certain pizzas that I've had where, where that, that type of pizza, it went actually surprisingly well. And then there's somewhere it was disgusting and it should have been whoever served it to me needed to be arrested. So that's how I feel about a lot of things when it comes to pizza toppings. Cause I'm a bit of a pizza connoisseur. Uh, I'm an anchovy guy, but it depends on what kind of pizza you're serving it on. I don't want anchovies on a regular, you know, um, style uh new york thin pizza if you get me chicago style bacino's stuffed crust pizza or stuffed pizza i should say with a, some anchovies and i'll eat it all right next uh okay we have so many really old movies says what is the difference between working on a marvel set versus a dc set interesting question but there is the there there isn't um when i was working on um a dc film the only difference at that time would be that it wasn't um interconnected entirely into the universe at large only because James and Peter weren't getting to um, be the architects of the universe at large at that point. So that was the only difference uh, was that you're, you know, you're playing in a space that felt like its own um, one shot or separate issue versus, you know, like some kind of when you're in the MCU, what's, what's fun about that and what is the direction that now the DCU is headed um, you don't know who could walk onto set at any point because both companies are incredibly secretive about their surprises, even with cast. And it's mm -hmm. like the time on, you know, the first Ant Man when all of a sudden Falcon walks up to set, and I was like, oh, there's going to be scenes with Falcon. Like what? Like we're part of this, you know, um, this this network of roots that form the trees that make this big beautiful forest. And that's what I'm so excited about with James. I I can't tell you guys how freaking excited i am that james is getting to shepherd and architect this design it's just it's what's needed to happen and i'm so grateful that um the powers that be put on their thinking caps and made such a good decision well you're you're gonna be you're gonna be in this new dc universe i fully expect i it. i feel like i kind of already i feel like james in a way kind of began things with his suicide squad. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was like a, he started a story that now f is, is, is foundational to mm -hmm. the DCU with Amanda Waller's significance in the role that she plays, what's happening with her entire office uh, of oversight. Um, obviously what's going on with peacemaker. So, you know um, but yeah, I think there's little, there's little splatterings of polka dot blood all over the DC. <laughs> well, we'll see. I, I, think um, he, I think what he does with the side characters is has been pretty amazing, especially with Guardians, uh, and and just the list of a lot of these titles I don't know about DC, and and feeling like yeah, if anyone could pull it off, it's James Gunn. Yeah. Um, hey, Alan, yeah. I see you. Thank you. <laughs> I Alan like Horton. that. Alan Horkin says, "In my head, canon Polka Dot Man survived because we never saw the body." <laughs> my wife has the same opinion. Uh, David, you are a class act. Love seeing you in film, says Bad Adam 12 for 10. Thank you for that. Bad Adam, I love that. By the way, we need Bad Adam to come and whoop some Shazam ass, okay? <laughs> uh, Ike 3 for 499 says, How did you prepare for your role in The Dark Knight, especially the complex role of a paranoid schizophrenic? It was done so masterfully. Bravo. Thank you. Uh, I'll tell you something. I, um, you look behind me, you see, this is just a smattering of a collection of comics that have been going for oh, my oh, life. Wow. That's um, a legit collection. Look at those long that's boxes. That's not even, I mean, that's not even close. Uh, and it, and, and it, it's to say to you guys that like, spent my life, you know, reading and, and caring about these characters and especially the underworld of the DC uh, comics, the, the DC villains were always my favorite. The Joker was always my favorite. And so I read anything that had the Joker appear in it that I could ever get my hands on. And 
you know, I was an actor in Chicago who had been a homeless heroin addict. For those of you who don't know, addiction nearly took my life, as did depression and mental illness. And so I spent about five years not acting at all, learning um, through recovery how to live sober, how to work with the you know help of um, uh, mental mental health, mental wellness. Um, therapy, psychiatry, et cetera. And I finally got to a place where I was able to get back on stage, which led me um, to starting to get to audition for things again. And I got a chance to audition for Chris Nolan's The Dark Knight. And I was such a huge fan of Batman Begins. And I thought, this is my opportunity. This is my my one moment to make my dream come true. Um, and it, and you guys got to understand, it's like, this is this to me was like the, I couldn't have imagined a more dream opportunity. So I prepared so hard for this audition and the character they were having us audition for was the bank robbers at the beginning of the film. Um, and I, um, and, and, I, and I got to get called back with, 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 with Chris Nolan. And um, I had prepared a character that the way that he was written and the way that I thought about him, I just felt like um, I know the kind of mind that a Joker attracts. It's just, it's a line in the script, but I know that well. And I thought like, who's, you know, just, just who's who's serving him who's putting their life on the line for him and i created this this whole kind of character and this identity and 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 luckily at the time i was devastated because i didn't get cast as one of those bank robbers at the beginning of the film and i was really sad because i thought that was my shot but the reality was he liked me and he was bringing me in for a, a different role which which he gave me um so they they filmed that bank heist sequence and I and I actually was I'm such a fan. I used to go down to sets and stand like two blocks away just to see if I could get a <laughs> glimpse. And I had a disposable camera at the time in 2007. And then like a few months later, they called and said, you're going to be in the movie. And um, it's a cool role. And um, and I got to go be Thomas Schiff, who um, makes so much sense to me. It just it just it just it made sense. The character made sense to me and it and it spoke true to the reality of the history of the comics and it was it was you know emotional and it was it was such a gift every role i've been given is is such a gift every every day that i'm given considering how nearly i came to taking my own life you guys and if you're out there and if you're watching this i don't care where you are i don't care who you are i don't care how bad you think it might be you have to believe me and look in my eyes and trust me when i say that it is possible and you can get help and you can get better and you're not alone. That is one of the dirtiest, darkest tricks that this life tries to play on us is making us feel like we're alone. Um, so glad you're here watching Chris's show because he creates this great community that reminds us we're not alone in this. We've got so many buddies out here to help us through and enjoy and savor and celebrate fandom and geekdom. But like um, if you're struggling today, uh, no, there is help and it's and it's free. You can go to SAMHSA, S-A-M-H-S-A dot gov. You can find all kinds of resources. And look, <laughs> this is my cat I adopted from the set of the Suicide Squad. Do you remember this story, Chris? Uh, no. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah this, is know, bubble yeah. Gum. this is bubblegum. This is bubblegum. Oh, my God. Uh, I know that you have to go. We were oh, yes, Caitlin. Hi, minutes. I'll be off in uh, – let's do like – do you have time, Chris? Do you want to do like five I, I have, Look, you've got like the questions. We've never had this many questions for oh, a guest. Oh, good. Oh, good. So I like I to go win. Quick. Thing, Chris, I'm very competitive. Tell me <laughs> who I have more questions than. Uh, more than Jim Gaffigan? More than like big directors? <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's this a good follow-up question. She is, she is a polka dot cat, you guys. We rescued on the streets of Panama while we were filming The Suicide Squad. Wow. And this is her favorite place to perch, putting her dirty butthole <laughs> up on my head in your face. That's what um, she thinks of us. Here's a good follow-up question. Fear the Turtle asks, how would you summarize working with Nolan in one word? He's my favorite director. Would love to know what it's like working with him confidence you know one of the if you're a soldier one of the, the the greatest generals you can ever ask for is one who is confident and confidence in vision is the recipe for um powerful filmmaking and people like denis villeneuve and peyton reed and christopher nolan and some james gunn the confidence in vision the confidence and power of of knowing their vision and understanding how to communicate what they need and what they want to tell the story that they're trying to tell is it's really inspiring you know it's uh 
That's why I know I'm not a director. I love being an actor. I love being a writer. I love helping bring stories to life. But um, a director is like, it's a, such a special art and it's um, it's fascinating. So yeah, and he's a hero. He's such a hero to me. He takes so many risks and he pushes the bounds of, of, of cinema. He never He never lives in the green zone of filmmaking. He's always pushing himself as far into the yellow as he possibly could go right on the edge of red. Um, it's like that engine's just always at that viscosity where you're like, is it going to burn up? What's going to happen? Uh, it's rad. Um, I, I, okay. I know you got to go just a cut. Do you have time for a couple more? Yeah. Yes. I, okay. I can do, um, I can do, uh, four till 1130. Cause then I have to go okay. to therapy. You guys. Okay. Three right. minutes. Patrick Lemire. We'll do quick. Do you ever have to stop yourself from correcting people on source material? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I do. I have not had much of that experience because a, I work with true nerds. When you talk about like Peyton, James, Chris, I mean, these guys, they know their shit. Like they know what they're talking about. Right. So they know more than me. That was one of the most impressive things when I first met um, Peyton was, you know, I started talking uh, and he, he, he out and geeked me in many a realm of sci-fi and comic book stuff. So no, one thing that is nice though is because I'm I'm a proud geek. Um, you'll be on set and somebody that you're working with um, who admires that, and that could be anybody. I mean, it's it's really cool when an actor like an Idris Elba or a Margot Robbie or somebody you know who I just admire so much as an actor asks me questions about comic books or if, if they're coming to me for insights. I remember working with Peter Capaldi, and he knows his stuff. I mean, that guy's a lover of science fiction and reading and music and everything and I love talking to you about thinker and my opinions on the character and the history of the character. And um, so that, that means a lot to me that like people will sometimes be like, Hey, what do you think about da, 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 you know? Uh, just, uh, I'm a Solomon Thornton says, I'm a huge fan of your work from dark Knight to Dune, sir, David, what is the best advice for how a director should work with an actor? I think creating safety is one of the most important things you can do. And when I say safety, I mean a mental, emotional, creative safety, a space where the actor feels encouraged to go to the places that they need to go without any concern. And the way that you do that is being as prepared as absolutely freaking possible. If you're not prepared, if you're showing up on the day and you don't have the answers to the questions that everybody needs, and you feel like if the director seems like they're lost at sea, it's so hard for me to put my faith in the work that I have to do that day. Um, so, so create a safe space by doing all of your preparation, knowing exactly what you need from every scene, knowing exactly what you're trying to achieve, because things are going to go wrong and things are going to fall apart and the lighting isn't going to work. And this location's going to have to change. And some actors not going to know their lines, right. And you're going to have to be able to continue to drive the train forward without losing your shit. Cause as soon as a director starts to feel frazzled, the whole house comes tumbling down. You have to go, um, one last, one last question. One last question. One last question. This is going to be a hard one. Brock Sampson, I, David, what has been your favorite role as a character oh. actor and why? Oh, that's guys, a, that's so hard. As a see? character actor. As a character actor, because as an actor, there's many. As a character actor, oh, my gosh. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've had so many fun ones. You guys have to see Quantum Mania. I think that go. I have to tell you, quick sidebar. Sorry, I know my 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 publicist is like, we got to get out of here because I do have to go. But listen, I was in a dark place, a dark place. I was having a very. My dad had just died. My the pandemic is so hard on all of us. I also just lost my mother. I had worked on a film that really nearly broke my body and will and. um and all of a sudden, I show up on the set of Peyton Reed's Quantum Mania. And this character, this gift of a character that he gave me, Veb, there was so much room for me to create and to explore and to um, play physically with my imagination. And one of the things that I love about working with these, with these people is that your imagination goes, well, what if I did this? What if this happened? What if my body started to make this happen? And they go, Let's see if we can do that. Hey, VFX, can we do this? Or, hey, what do you guys think? And, and it just is like this constantly growing, moving, magical thing. That character, 
I, I haven't seen him much at all. I can't wait to see the film, but pl playing him, bringing him to life, uh, bringing Veb to life was truly one of, um, was the most joy I've ever had um, in, 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 in being a character actor. Okay. Well, we haven't seen it yet. Congratulations. Follow David on Instagram, David Desmulchin. Uh, follow him. Your Instagram is very active. I love it. That's how I found out about your signing. I'll see you next Wednesday for your signing. Have fun at the world premiere. I always watch those red carpets. And it's always so great to see you and your lovely wife on, on the red carpet. So I assume that you'll be doing an interview there. Oh, yes, yes. And she's making her own dress for the red carpet. And it's <laughs> so cool. And it's themed around my character. Because Oh, bored. that's great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. All right, David, you got to get to your appointment. Dude, I love you, you, man. So it's so good to see love you. Me, You're yeah. awesome. Good to meet you. Cool. All right, Bye. take care. Bye. Thanks, Later. Guys. Oh, wow. That wow. was, he's such, he's a good dude. It, okay. I could go on and on. He is a legit nerd. He knows his stuff. And I'm sorry we didn't get to all your questions. We do have a super chat here. Uh, so we'll, uh, we're going to keep. We'll answer it for him. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sorry. But um, David, the thing that I'm excited about is this new company, Good Fiend yeah. Films, doing like low budget, you know, indie, like sci fi fantasy horror is so perfect. And again, I, I said in, in the introduction, David's one of those rare actors that understands the craft he understands the genre he gave us a brief tour there's another interview with david on the channel if you just look up his name and search our channel i did an interview with him right before suicide squad came the suicide squad came out and he talks about suicide squad and dune so um, i have to say uh speaking of his there a movie he put out a couple of years ago called all creatures here below uh, yeah, that, that movie stars Karen Gillan and himself. It, it's like a of mice and men type story, but it it's a drama. But it it hits into a lot of the themes he was talking about today. This is uh, I it, actually interviewed him for that movie, but mm -hmm. it was when the podcast was only audio. Yeah. So, um, uh, maybe you can but, find that interview. I don't know if we yeah, put it on the channel. I highly suggest that movie. All creatures here below. It, it's yeah. dark, but it. Uh, it just gets into this idea that he's been talking about, about, um, you know, about broken people trying to uh, overcome and survive in this world. And uh, it, it is it, it's heart wrenching. It's gut wrenching. Uh, it's tragic. But it's a it's a fantastic movie. He wrote and directed it. And uh, yeah, go see it. It'll, it'll... By, the, by the way, David will be back on the show. He is yeah. a regular recurring, probably before Oppenheimer, maybe when Boogeyman comes out in June. Well, it sounds like if if we're going to South by Southwest. Uh, we'll be oh, there. we'll talk to him at South by Southwest. Yeah. Exactly. But I'm so sorry. I want to say uh, apologies to the chat. I didn't get to you the, the, the questions. And these are very good questions. Yeah. Jinx asks, are you playing Brewster Gold? Um, Sven Gooley, Shelby Loves, like so many good questions questions in the chat and i just uh we had limited time gabriel kiroga has a ten dollar super chat and asks david chris allen uh, oh. me and my friend have an idea for a horror movie we want to shoot i want to work on the script he wants to start a production company for legitimacy which one is more important or both i'll tell you exactly what's more important the script you only need a company if someone's going to give you money and so in order to receive money for your movie or to do certain deals. There may be tax advantages to starting a production company, starting a production. Anyone can start a production company. Every single person, the 500 people watching this, you're all producers. You start, uh, uh, an, uh, you know, an LLC, you do it probably in a, in a, in a different state. That's more, uh, that, that has better tax advantages. Um, and you, and you start that production company, which is literally just a, but, but it's really just for one project and you only really need that to make deals or to receive money. The most important thing, story, story, story. You know who said that earlier this week? James Gunn. It was one of the, I mean, I was kind of mixed on his announcement. Um, there were encouraging things. There were things that were not so encouraging. Um, but the one thing he said that, uh, you know that, and I am I am a James Gunn. I am a James Gunn believer. I believe it. I and, but I'm also taking a wait and see approach. Yeah. But I but I but I think that the what he said about story story story, is that's the important thing. Start with that. The production company. That's the easiest part. 
It's literally filing papers that you can do probably on a legal website. You know, you can do it and pay a couple of fees and then, and then the production company. And also here's another thing. You don't need to buy all the equipment. You can rent it even better. Hire a cinematographer who has his own equipment, uh, has his or her own equipment. That way um, you get two for one. You get someone to fill the role of a, a director of photography and you also get your equipment. Most of the most important thing you need, you need a camera and lights. That's, that's what you need. Camera and lights. And also two things I would recommend focusing on. Um, two things that bring production value to a movie. One is cast. Cast is vitally important who you cast. Don't cast your friends. Cast actors. Um, SAG even has like a SAG indie contract. that You can make movies with SAG actors. So look for really incredible talent in your key roles. So cast and location, that will increase production value. Then you got your, your, your DP, your cinematographer. Those three, focus on that. The production company, if you think you need it, fine. If you need like, here's my company to, to protect you legally, yes. And, and also own everything. Don't use- Don't like, give anything away. Yeah, don't get, no, no. What don't I sign is, anything away. Don't, don't sign anything away, but also use things that hire a composer. If you're going to have original music, hire a composer. If you're going to like, meaning, you know, do everything on the up and up and then you can, uh, you can release your movie. Yeah. Let me, let me point you to my interview with Stephen Merchant. Uh, Cause I asked him the question, uh, what would you, what advice would you give to a director uh, who has completed the script? You know, you have, you have finally your script done and you think it's ready to go. And I asked him, what should that director do? And he gives some amazing advice for that. So, so, I mean, and also keep watching Film Threat because you can ask those questions. It will bring mm -hmm. people on who can give thorough answers. I knew yeah, Jamie and if you super chat it, then we can ask the actor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> here's the problem. Is, I, 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 I feel like, I, feel like um, I could give you a good answer to that question, having, having worked on that stuff. So, Gabriel, I hope you accept my answer. And um, I really wanted to get to so many of your other questions. Another super chat came in from Jonas J. Campbell for two. Hey, my pal, Al, Alaning, you're welcome for the follow. Oh, thanks. <laughs> That's hey, I have to say, um, I have noticed everyone's comments about my mom in, in the chat, and it's greatly appreciated. And, uh, and I thank you for uh, not only being part of our community, but I, th I thank you for being here and being a, a, a regular viewer of our live cast here. But thank you, thank you for the the kind notes and, uh, and thoughts. Yeah, um, and that's gonna probably yeah, that's gonna. Kara says music makes half of peace. Yeah, like it's music, music and sound. Mm -hmm. And Flaccid Phoenix says everyone sl better slap that like button. And I, imp Alan oh. is starring. Alan is starring all the nice comments about Alan. <laughs> Imperfect says, we love you, Alan. We love you, Alan, says Pip-Boy Gamer. Everyone's Thank you. Everyone's saying nice things about Alan. We, yeah. don't have to, we don't have to read all of those, Alan. Yeah. So, uh, but I want to say thank you to everyone here. Uh, you make doing this so much fun. Um, you know, I, I look forward to Fridays and talking movies with you. Alan looks forward to something like this. <laughs> Yeah, it makes me think about moving to Florida sometimes. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, I want to thank you all. Uh, we've got so much good stuff coming up over the next couple of weeks. March is going to be a busy month. Cocaine Bear is coming. Um, so we are going to be covering all those movies. Uh, I mean, we are going to be talking nerd stuff. We, all, we always talk about nerd stuff. Those so cocaine tra trailers are not helping cocaine. Oh, bear. my God. They're so crazy. And also our awards coverage of the Oscars. Uh, just a little just a little taste of what we're going to be doing an Oscars watch party, which is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be talking about all the trailers that are going to be playing at the Super Bowl. I'm wondering, should we do a Super Bowl watch party? No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because there's like 11 major movie trailers. play. I mean, we'll talk about them on our Wednesday show. Yeah. Um, but, but Oscars are going to be coming it up. It stinks. It stinks. So... <laughs> <laughs> you do kind of look like the critic 
I know. I I did not see that one, so I had It to stinks. It stinks. Well, yeah, we're going to uh, be doing, we will be doing an Oscars watch party. We will talk about all the new trailers that come out uh, from the Super Bowl. And we appreciate our audience is growing. Now we usually get like 600 or more every live stream. We didn't start out that way. There's literally like 25 people, you know, hey, I know that guy. Who's this guy, Alan? And uh, we really appreciate you. So uh, you know what to do. Follow us on social media. We're film thread on everything. I'm that Chris Gore, even though I rarely tweet. Uh, but but I do on occasion. Alan, anything else you have coming up? Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, just my pal Al on Twitter and then Film Threat Alan on Instagram. And I know Alan is very grateful for all your support, you know. Um... How would you define exploitation, Alan? Exploitation? Uh, gratuitous. Gratuitiveness. We have to end the show with this. It's not a made-up word. It's a. <laughs> it knows. It's just a mispronounced word, uh, <laughs> and that word was exactly the word I meant to say in that. In that question. I believe. I believe you. Hey, yeah. thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next Wednesday at one p.m. Pacific time for Hollywood on the Rocks. Uh, Alan, what else? Let's get out of here.